everybody. This is Cindy Allen, Editor-in-Chief of Interior Design, and you are in the midst of Best of Design 2020, and we are in day two of our Hall of Fame Film Festival. For those of you just tuning in, Interior Design's Hall of Fame honors architects, designers, and industry luminaries whose talent, vision, and dedication contribute to the highest standard of excellence in all areas of design. And I like to say, simply put, it's our Oscars. And over my career as Editor-in-Chief, I've been lucky enough to spend time with these awe-inspiring talents and film these mini docs that we then feature at our big gala event in New York, actually, usually this week. Well, since we can't be together, we thought the next best thing would be to share them all with you. Plus, stay tuned because after most, I have a one-on-one -on -one chat to catch up and talk about what they're up to and their vision for the future. How amazing is that? Now, before we get started, I want to give a sincere thank you to all of our 2020 Hall of Fame sponsors. Thank you, Benjamin Moore. Thank you, Material Bank. And thank you, Turf, for this amazing backdrop. Now, we have a big lineup for day two. First, we jet to Paris for the colorful India Madhavi, who was inducted in 2019. Then, off to Seattle with partners Jim Olson and Tom Cundin of Olson Cundin. They were inducted in 2012. Oh, and after, I catch up with Tom. Next stop, Stuttgart, where we visit the studio of Peter Ippolito and Gunter Flights of Ippolito Flights. They were inducted in 2015, and we catch up with them after. Next up, we head to our beloved New York City with LTL. Now that's Paul Lewis, Mark Suramaki, and David Lewis. And stick around after, because we have a chat. And then next is the bold and brilliant Tony Chi, inducted in 2009. And after, Tony and his daughter Allison the managing director and future face of the company, join me for a chat. Then, one of the world's foremost trend forecasters, Lee Edelcourt. She was inducted in 2017. And stick around, because later she talks about design for good. And the day's finale, drum roll please, we head west to LA for our final inductee of the day, Hagi Belsberg, inducted in 2014. Inspiring, right? a lot of my memory as a, as a source of inspiration. After high school here in Paris, I think I took one year where I went to the movies three times a day. And I saw so many of them, German movie, Italian neorealism, the American movies. And I really fed myself with those images and I kind of trained my eye to see like a camera. Yeah. I know what's photogenic. You have a lot of languages. You speak a lot of languages. You studied architecture. Yeah. You did graphic design and product design, furniture design. Yeah. You're multi everywhere you turn. I like to define myself as a polyglot and polychrome. And it's a way of saying that I mix everything together um, my references are multiple. What I've lived through, what I've seen, what I've digested. And I've had to adapt all my life. Okay, when you move the whole time, what you do is what you're good at is understanding the codes of place and you just grab them and you move them yours. I've learned to become a chameleon. I was born in Iran. My family moved to the United States, to Cambridge, Massachusetts, when I was a year and a half. They were the happiest years of my life just because my family was all together. The memories I had of 
of that period are very colorful. I remember waking up watching color television, which was like a huge thing. And I remember going to school with my lunchbox. Mm. And I've kept within me this love of colors. It was a breath of fresh air when we first showed India. It was the first time we did color in Pucci. Everyone's looking for what's new and next, and India certainly has her pulse on that. Ralph came to me, I think, in 2005, and he really loved the freshness of it, the colors, but he kept on saying, I'm not so sure America's ready for this. I'm not so sure America's ready for all these colors. These colors come from America. <laughs> <laughs> they come from my lunchbox. I just want you to know. Exactly. <laughs> You know, I think India is really in her own little unique world. I remember when we created the walls in this space, someone came in and said, oh, that's the ugliest green I have ever seen. And I said, just wait, it's going to be fabulous. India is a magician. It's that simple. She just creates magic. There is definitely an emotional quality to all the work. Where is that coming from within you? Yeah, I think happiness is part of my work. You know, when I come in, in a colorful room, I feel the sun, I feel the light, I feel the happiness, I feel the joy. Color has become a mean of expression to me. Yes. But I want to show you, for instance, yeah. uh, you know, I have some bright colors, but this is so typical. You know, you can mix yeah. these together. Yeah. yeah, velvet is really interesting because it takes the light uniquely. Uh, India forced us to look further. What this was about is like creating a box of crayons to me. Mm. In the beginning of my career, I really found a way of defining my projects through color. Right. And I just realized that because I had the ability to dare, yeah. it felt just so natural for me. I remember a project I did in Mexico in Condesa with the Grupo Habita yeah. and Jonathan Moore. Originally it was planned with all these shutters with tons of colors. And mm. then they told me, no, we're scared of color, do it all white. So we made it all white and I came and it was, yeah, it was a bit boring. So then I took this turquoise and I said, paint all the ground floor this color. And the next day we came back and it suddenly grounded the whole yeah, project in right. a very different way. Right. There was a red of townhouse. Then I started mixing a lot of colors and a lot of textures together. Mm. And I had an ability to do that. It was just like a challenging myself of saying, you know what, I can mix flowers and geometric patterns and colors up to 16 different patterns together yeah. and get away with it. And that's what I used in Le Germain and I right. had fun with it just proving myself I could do that. Wow. And then suddenly Sketch came up. Sketch has three or four restaurants, and yeah. this was just one big room they had. And also it was a room that was dedicated to this artist, David Trigley. Right, so you already had his art. So I go down, I see the room, and I say, yeah, I think it should be pink. And Morad Mazouz, the owner, said, mm, no, I don't like pink, but you do whatever you want. It's a very immersive room. And of course, for that project, I designed this little chartered chair because it looks like a plumpy little cake, which has become a signature piece, yeah. By the way, there's no project that could be yours forever as La Durée. Oh, right. I mean, come on, it is so you. It's true that I've done three La Durées. They had in the DNA a relation to French classic, to Marie Antoinette. Yeah. And they came to me saying, what is La Durée today? And I said, well, you know, something very simple. It's Marie Antoinette traveling. What is Marie Antoinette when she goes to Hollywood? What is it like when she goes to Geneva? What would she like if she goes to Japan? So it's a garden of sweetness. Mm. Here we're on my street, uh, on the street Las Cas. <laughs> so it all started here. This was my studio. That's amazing. So these are the heroes of my childhood. Here's the nod. Yeah. And then I found this the studio upstairs, mm. and I decided to transform this into a showroom. Here we're in the studio, which is like the head of all the creative 
part. It would be nice if we painted it a bright color, maybe a yellow. The design of furniture and objects, the interior design, the scenography, the architecture, it all happens here. Look all at this. the colors. I did a chess oh my game goodness. with my bishop, and we're doing the salt and pepper like <laughs> this. I usually design a piece of furniture for every single project I do. Mm. And this is the second space I opened, which is all about small objects. Come on in. This is what sort of makes me happy. Mm -hmm. Move objects, high energy. Gee, by the way, it smells delicious in here. Thank you. And everything you want to touch and take home, <laughs> basically. Mm -hmm. in, in fact, I never wanted to become an architect. Really, all of this is a big accident. <laughs> uh, I, I wanted to become a, a filmmaker. Right. Once I finished my architecture school in Paris, I went to New York for a year and I took these courses at Parsons, at Cooper Union, and actually it gave me a very different intake. You know how you think of architecture? You start with a site and you zoom in. Mm. You know, and suddenly it was the other way around as you started with a small element and you're zooming out is, yes. you know, so it's a, it was a different perspective. So you liked seeing that, right? It, so I came back to Paris and I had, it was full of energy. We're Place de la Bastille. So this is where the whole French Revolution started, you know. Oh my goodness. This is one of the big cafes I designed for the Thierry and Gilbert Post. It's a revisited brasserie. Mm. We wanted this to be strong enough to hold the void of the city. This is like the kind of project that will last for the next 20 years. That's what we do. Right. I capture the sign of the time. I like giving people a way to feel they're somewhere special. Mm. But at the same time, I don't want it to be overwhelming. It seems to me that your like, toolbox is full of all these things that you can use. I love going back and forth to Iran. You know, there's a lot of diversity in terms of architecture, in terms of history. They've liberated themselves from the rules. Right. And there's something soft and beautiful and rough and hard at the same time. And those two together actually create something that's quite fascinating. Are we talking about you? <laughs> In some way, we're talking about you. Yeah, way. maybe, yeah. 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 Oh, India told me, I don't want to sound like I'm boasting, but I changed the way people think about pink. <laughs> yeah, and she wasn't boasting at all. She did. Now, stick around, there's much, much more. There's something that I always find so beautiful about Jim's work. There's sort of this almost luminescence to the work, like when you walk through the forests or you experience the, uh, the skies in the Seattle area. There's sort of a, there's sort of a character, there's a, there's a grounding in that kind of atmosphere, which I think is fantastic, it's beautiful. To me, the greatest luxury is being close to nature. Well, I always say, how could I design anything how could we design anything that's more beautiful than the natural world? I mean, that's our muse, our touchstone. So in a way, the architecture, the interiors, everything is somewhat subservient to what's happening outside in these incredible landscapes. I grew up in the Northwest, and I always loved art. I liked to draw, but I also liked to like make forts in the woods. I always loved to be outside, and I like to try to make indoor spaces feel as though they're outside. Wow. So in this direction, we're looking out into nature, and then on this side, we're really looking at the art. And American Place is a good example 
of the house weaving itself into nature. This is like paradise. <laughs> no? It is it's paradise. Like, yeah. For me, it's one of Jim's best houses because I think it just speaks to this climate, this sort of landscape so clearly. In western Washington, the trees are tall, they have canopies and things, and so you're like in the environment in a different way. The landscape, the architecture, the interiors, furnishings, art, all that, to me it's, it's all one thing. And I think Tom in eastern uh, Washington, it's sort of more wide open space and things are clear and he does these, you know, really strong shapes and forms and objects that are out there on the landscape. I grew up in a high desert. It's harder, it's more extreme, it's more like raw in a way. I can kind of clearly see that there's a desire for that rawness or there's a desire for that edge that seems to be comfortable for me to sort of explore. This house is important for me because it was really the first house where I had a client that actually understood the beauty of steel. Mm. Just the beauty of raw steel, natural steel, and in this case, blackened steel. Oh. And so that's what's great about the residential arena is that you can make these connections with clients that just allow you to go somewhere where you always wanted to go. My dad's an architect, and uh, I grew up around architects and artists. When I left home, I was really more interested in sciences, hard sciences. And although I was interested in it, there was something that was missing in my life, and it was this, uh, this sort of craziness, that I, uh, this sort of art, this sort of poetry that I grew up with. My little thing came out of art, and, and Tom's came out of physics, and he calls it the, his weirdness. And so. I have my weirdness over here and his is over there. But I think they both are sort of vehicles for a way to get into architecture. And architecture is about life. It isn't about buildings. It's about all kinds of things. I joined the firm in 1986 and I had been with a small firm up in Alaska. So there was a sort of an overlay there with the big natural landscape of Alaska, of course, the climbing, skiing scene, and then doing architecture in this big wild country. The great thing about climbing was there's a leader on the rope, but then there was always somebody backing them up. And you would actually sort of flip, you know, on the route as you went up the mountain. And I always thought that was such a great sort of partnership model in a way, because sometimes you were the lead on the rope, you were the one taking the risk, you were the one that was hanging it out, but you had a partner there, you had somebody belaying you. There's absolute respect and protection and sort of support system that allows uh, each person to sort of lead. So the idea of this house is that it sort of Beautiful. opens and closes to that environment. It's all about understanding the local climate conditions, the local sun conditions, and how do you translate that understanding into a building. In northwestern Washington state, light is scarce, especially in the winter. And so probably the most important thing we could do is bring in natural light. The light catcher might be the best illustration of using natural light and sunlight. The Mission Hill Winery is all about not getting light down into the cellar. The tower is actually used as the luminaire so that when people come from the very bright sunlight that they can have this transition through the stairs they come into the cellar below. Wow, what a beautiful spot you yeah. have. I'm really interested in light, but I'm also interested in how glass transmits and oh. reflects. I think the glass is a really great material to constantly be tweaking and fussing with. I don't think I've ever been in a space like this before. It's well, like this prism, right? A yeah, holiness, exactly. you know? <laughs> exactly. It isn't really officially open to the public mm. yet. So you're getting a little sneak preview of uh, Chapel of the Future here in, in Seattle. 
here we are right on a busy downtown street corner, yet it's completely open and so people can sit in here and have a very different kind of feeling of sanctuary. Yes, yes. We're both little kids trying to get outside. I mean, that's very interesting. Um, yet you're doing beautiful architecture and interiors. You well, know, but they're every bit the part of the exterior. In fact, that's, that's the whole idea is how do you bring that exterior back into the interior and vice versa. The idea here is you basically can open up your studio or your gallery completely to the alley below so you can bring up materials. It's like I mean, a vault. Well, you just kind of vault like that. I think we need to talk about that instinct for you to open things. I remember growing up with that sort of frustration that these houses couldn't kind of like breathe to the outside. So I had a client and he said, geez, I wish, it's such a beautiful place, it's such a beautiful view, I wish we could just open up the entire front end of the house. And I went, all You were right. like, that's uh, it. That's all I needed to hear. <laughs> And that was an important project for me because the physics involved, the engineering involved, finally opening the front end of a house to the outside. So your living room becomes basically right. your deck. Yeah, you can see that. Ideas in this office are whatever you want to imagine. You can imagine it and then try to make something happen out of it. Jim brought up this idea, oh, there's a storefront, you know, we yeah. should rent it because this area is going through some tough times in, in Seattle. Alan Maskin and Kirsten, our two other partners, got a hold of the idea and took it way beyond yeah. what I had imagined. We're able to provide design to people who have ideas and we build these ideas together. Each month, it's something different and a new group takes it over. We've created 12 completely different experiments and installations uh, that have been open to the public. It, it, it has no constraints. It allows kind of an open framework for doing interesting things. And we can say yes to things. The main reason that we're here is to try to do the best design that we possibly can, whatever that means to us. I think there's this <laughs> earnestness about both of us about what we're doing. Like we're really into it. I mean, like we really are into it. It's not just an architecture firm. It's not just an art firm. It's not any, you know, design firm. It, it's design is, it's like an attitude about making our world a better place. Hey everybody, this is Cindy Allen, Editor-in-Chief of Interior Design. You've just watched our mini documentary we produced a few years back when we were inducting Olsen Kundig into the Hall of Fame. And now we have a live, and it's a real treat, Tom Kundig. Hi, Tom. Oh, hi, Cindy. Real treat to see you digitally, but it's fantastic as always. I know, it's so funny. Um, people don't know this about you. One thing they're gonna learn right away is it is so early. It's 10 o'clock my time, but seven in the morning we're filming you. That's insane. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that is a little insane, but honestly, uh, mornings are some of my best times because as, as you know, you're either doing your design work in the evening, like a lot of designers do, or you do it in the morning. I'm a morning person. Yeah, I love that because I, you know, yesterday I was checking, I said, just check with their people, just make sure that we're talking about seven in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah, I'm sure they, I'm sure they had no problem saying that. No, I know, I know, I know. going to be a problem. Well, listen, the last time I saw you, you were giving me a sneak peek mm. into a new project and not what everyone else thinks because it's a book, your fourth book. And um, we were all excited. We were in New York together, remember? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You saw, oh, I had like a big pile of paper with all right. sorts of uh, disorganized in many ways, but you immediately got it, which is... Yeah, well, you know, we call them galleys, but I love seeing... The behind, this, the behind the scenes and, and just talking to you about it. You know, it's, it, and it always reminds me of being an editor, right? This is when I see the architect as editor. And I always feel that kind of kinship of you critiquing your own work in a printed version of it. Ooh, that's pretty interesting. I, I completely agree with that. I think sometimes the background work 
is as interesting as as the finished project. In fact, sometimes when a when a project is under construction, that's sometimes the most inspirational moment of a project because you see this thing that is developing and you don't necessarily have an understanding of how it is being developed and sometimes it's un, it's an unbelievable source of inspiration to yeah. to go to a next to to maybe go to a next uh, exploration yeah I couldn't agree that. more i love that and you know there are a few things that we want to share with people first of all there was something lovely that was sent to me about you growing up in spokane and mm -hmm. how the whole mining and lumber and agriculture, mm -hmm. how that has framed everything you do, which by the way, when you hear that, it makes complete sense. <laughs> well, that's, that's pretty interesting but because there is, there's a conflict there, right? Because mining and the lumber industry and even uh, agricultural industry are actually environmentally pretty aggressive, mm -hmm. fr frankly. And, and I think I recognize that even as a kid, certainly in the silver mines of, of Northern Idaho. But there was something about uh, the way those things operated and the way they were invented to operate because our ancestors were so smart about being able to use existing physics and, you know, on all levels, hydrology, gravity, whatever. And I just, as a kid, for whatever reason, found them very interesting to, uh, to watch, basically. Yeah, but that, that's become your life's work, right? It's like you were dreaming another way to use everything and another way to see things, which is so exciting. Well, yeah, you're right, Cindy, because in fact, uh, to watch those things and to watch actually most things, I mean, even culturally what we're going through right now, it's all about, the, it's all about nature. It's all about how does nature work? And obviously the way nature works, the nature of nature is really important to, to how I think about everything I do every day of my life. So it's, uh, mm -hmm. it's just a component. And uh, it, was, uh, it was an incredible source of inspiration and remains uh, an incredible source of inspiration. I grew up working for an artist on his sculptures. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I think sometimes the sculptures were more interesting in the process of happening. Yeah. Uh -huh. in the process of these things sort of emerging and the way Harold would hammer out shapes and how he would sort of invent how to make things, completely fascinating as for a kid. I, lo I love that. All right, so let's, so let's get to the book. Um, I think you need to first tell us uh, why the name, which is working title. <laughs> I don't even know. It was like, well, you know, some people say, well, it's because you're always working. And so you're always thinking about the word work. And I, I honestly, I answer, well, you know, it's interesting you say that because in a way, I, what I do is work, whatever that means, is not really work. I just, um, you know, I, I spend all an inordinate amount of hours just doing what I do. So it's not, work it has, a funny, has a, a funny connotation. I actually think it's kind of a fantastic word because you're making things, you're changing potentially the world for a, for a, for a better, better way. And working title, honestly, you know, I see it in the movies, you know, of course, when they're sort of um, trying to figure out, you know, how that title might work. And I just love that um, term working title because it means that things are in transition. Things are kind of being reconsidered. And that's the way this book is supposed to uh, come off is that, this is a trans, you know, I'm, everybody's always in transition. Right. This is a transition. And um, working title is, frankly, implying that things are moving, things are changing. Yeah, well, it, it, definitely, it definitely gives you like a sense right away that it's going to be a special and a little bit different book, which, which I do love. Now, I know it, 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 um, it covers 29 projects and they're not, yeah. you know, they're pretty recent too. It's kind of yeah. fantastic. And the range, you know, we always talk to designers about ha trying to have a broad range, but the range is really, really broad from residential to commercial, mm -hmm. cultural, culinary. It's kind of fantastic. Mm -hmm. You get it all, right? Well, see, and, and I'm sure Cindy, you know better than anybody that I, what, what I've always said is that the residential arena in fact feeds all of these other projects because you know as a designer um and the editor of a of a, a design a super important design magazine because you're all you guys are also telling that story yeah. basically it doesn't really matter right. it's all about design it's some it's about solving problems it's about understanding the problem and for an architect to understand the residential arena i think 
informs everything, whether it's a, a wooden boat shop or whether it's a, a museum or a culinary uh, institution. It's all about, you know, what's it like to be a human being? What's it like to flow through the space? What's it like to sort of understand proportions? Um, so the residential arena grounds it and then everything comes from it. You know what's so interesting that you say that is that many times we see a lot of experimentation in the commercial work, right? Let's say like hospitality, well, all different times of commercial work, but we see that kind of risk being taken and then a different version of it might come around in residential, but you really experimented, found, found the right mm -hmm. kind of clients that would allow you to experiment almost reverse in the residential world. Totally, totally agree. And that was almost, I'd like to say it was a brilliant idea. <laughs> I think I just sort of fell into it. What I realized as a kid, because my background, you know, maybe I started into architecture a little late, even though I grew up in architecture, to just really be serious as a professional, I started a little late. I realized that I had to, if I wanted to really sort of realize a lot of these things, I had to work in an arena that went relatively quickly. Mm -hmm. So that, you, you know, because to your point, a commercial project might be uh, five to seven years. I, the, the Burke Museum is a 10 year project, you know? And somebody said to me, well, I bet you're looking forward to your next uh, museum, Burke Museum. I'm going, well, I'm, running, I'm running out of time, you know? Yeah. But the residential arena and even the TI arena allows you to sort of think about that nano level invention. Um, and then, uh, and rather quickly, you see the, the, the you know, you see the circle in, in uh, one or two years rather than five to 10 years. Does that make sense? And yeah, does that, no, I've, no that's compl that completely makes sense. And I think it's very, very true and valid by the way. But the fact that you were able to do it is a testament to your talent and your vision, honestly. Well, okay, so we wanna, have, we wanna show everybody some of, the, some of the projects that are in the book. And I, I love that what's, how it's broken up. So designing for human experience, adaptive reuse and architecture in nature, right? So that, I mean, they couldn't be more relevant. They've always been mm -hmm. relevant, but like right now it just pulls at your oh, heart yeah. how relevant mm -hmm. they are. Um, well, I guess we should start with the cover of the book, which is, mm -hmm. which is in the <clears throat> chapter designing for human experience. And that's the Martin's Lane Winery, right? So Martin's Lane is actually a project for a client that I've been working with for probably now, I don't know, I'd have to do the math, probably 15 or 20 years. I mean, he's been an amazing supporter uh, and hired me uh, for a number of projects that were really deeply meaningful, not only working for him, but also for the group up there and in that landscape. Now, uh, the Spokane landscape is very similar to the Okanagan, Canadian Okanagan landscape. So when I went up here the first time 15, 20 years ago, I was, well, in fact, I was home. We almost moved to Penticton as, oh, really? as, as kids. Oh, yeah. Um, my parents had come from Switzerland, so they basically could live anywhere, and they <clears throat> landed in Spokane. But we had a lot, most of our friends were up in Cranbrook and Penticton. The, uh, the reason I'm super happy with that cover, Cindy, let's see if this makes sense to you. And I actually, I had people push back on me that it was not a residential project. It was not a, a, a building that you could see. And I said, that's the that's point. That's it, that's, that's it. That's exactly, the point yeah. is that this, this, this winery, which is, wine is all about the, the ground, the terroir. Yeah. It's all about what's happening in the ground. The idea is that this building sort of like whispers into the background, into the landscape, and it becomes part of the landscape. It's the same angle as the uh, the slopes of the vineyards beyond, and even the in, even the hills. So it's second glance. It's a hopefully, hopefully, it's a second glance uh, cover. It's almost like working title. It almost disappears if you right. if you look at it at a certain angle. It kind of flashes a little bit, and then you look at it, it almost disappears. It's the idea with the my architecture, at least. I'm not going to, I've said it a million times, I'm not going to design anything more beautiful than nature. Everything about nature is the inspiration. So it's already, I'm already interpreting that. If there's a way to make that, you know, architecture just feel like it's part of the, part of the nature of nature. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, it totally does. And um, a, a, a few thoughts about that is that, you know, first of all, being part of the landscape is what we talk about all the exactly. time. You've just proved exactly. it with that cover. It's a stunning cover, but it's also it's also mysterious and it makes you want to open the book, which I think is part of, you know. Well, that's good. Yeah. 
And hopefully when you open the book, you like what's inside. But, you absolutely, but it there's, is. No question, there's no question about that. I do like how you talk about the, the landscape and you sort of frame it like it's almost like wine pouring. It was so beautiful. Mm. Yeah, well, be, yeah, because it's basic, well, it, it, there's a whole sort of chapter basically about the way that wine is made and, and you know, mm. in a gravity sort of situation and the way the building is assembled to sort of get as much daylighting. It's, it's kind of like you take the box and you do this if you look at it closely. So then all of a sudden you get daylighting in the center of the box, you follow the, the land. You it, Anyway, it's, it really, I, I, I look back on that project and, and for me, Cindy, it's a project that fell together. It's almost as if in, I, I had sort of um, worked my hair, worked for all these years and then all of a sudden there was a, there was a, a functional solution that became a poetic solution, if that makes sense. And it was Anthony that basically um, uh, hired me to, to make that moment. So as usual, the clients are the most important part of any of our projects, because in fact, if it wasn't for a client, we wouldn't have that opportunity. Absolutely, and, and you had done, um, this is your second winery for them, as, right? Yeah, this is this is second, and uh, oh no, this is well, yeah, it, you're right. It, really, second significant one. Now we're working on a third and fourth, uh, uh, with and we're doing his home on uh, on the lake. So not bad. Uh, it, no, it's it's fantastic because again, it's a landscape that I know well, um, and it's a a place that I just love. Wonderful. That's beautiful. Okay, so another theme um, in the human experience is the Burke Museum, and that's mm -hmm. right in Seattle. And that's really a special project. And I love there was something about like breaking down the barriers between the public mm -hmm. and the back of and the back of house. Tell us about it. Well, that was Julie Stein's agenda. And uh, I, of course, agreed to uh, a hundred percent with her, with her agenda because in fact my background is about looking in the background remember when we talked about sculptures i actually like the way sculptures are being made almost more than when they're when they're finished or or a building the when it's being constructed so that's what julie is really uh saying about um about the burke is that it's not just about the exhibits out in front in fact the exhibits are finding the culmination of a bunch of work right. but in fact maybe for kids, the most inspirational part, especially for kids, the most inspirational part is actually how it's done. How you take these mysteries of nature and you sort of assemble them, or, or well, you reassemble them or you sort of collect them and begin to understand them. That's what a scientist does. So that story is the basis for the Burke to break down that barrier between what is happening behind the screen and, uh, and how it affects what's happening in front of the screen. So the whole, I call it the Swiss cheese scheme, <laughs> which is basically a whole bunch of holes to sort of look inside. And the reason it's a Swiss cheese scheme, if this makes sense, is that also collections are about protection, right? You have, these are fragile materials. There's DNA material, uh, well, it's all DNA. A lot of it is DNA material, but there's also um, there's also skin. There's fur. There's um, um, uh, works on paper. There's you know works on bark. There's a whole bunch of really uh, environmentally fragile things that are intended to be collected and studied. So you have to be sort of strategic about how you open into behind the closet, you know, behind the behind the uh, door, the storage right. door, and then um, how you close it off also. Yeah, you know, as you know, I think of, I also think of you as architects and designers, but also as an editor, we're always trying to make things look beautiful, right? And, yep. and sometimes behind isn't as pretty, but that's, that's Ooh. the interesting part, right? That's exactly right. I like the not pretty part because yeah. it's sort of, it means it's moving. It means right. there's something, there's something mysterious. There's something uh, that's changing. When we went to the back of the house, uh, before we started on the design, uh, we went to the back of the house. I saw all these like uh, uh, First Nation canoes and and uh, 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 bones and stuff like that, just kind of stuck on, love on it, shelves. Love it. Yeah. And I said, "Oh my God, this is this is where the magic is." Yeah, that's it. That's it. Oh, that's great. That's wonderful. It's a beautiful project. Um, I was really excited uh, to go through the images of that. You got to go visit. 
Okay, I'm going to move you and go see it. Yeah. Proof, proof, as as you know, architecture proofs in the pudding. It's the real thing. It's it really you have to show up and experience it. You're going to show up. All right. So next theme is adaptive reuse, and I I Mm. love that we're going to over over on the East Coast in my hometown, over in New York, and frankly, Long Island City. Mm -hmm. It's an unlikely project, but um, (laughs) I mean. It's called Mr. Steam, but it's so interesting that they had the building since the 60s. It's kind of amazing, right? Yeah, you know, uh, this whole re- adaptive reuse um, situation, I think, and I've been saying that in my last quarter of my career, I'm seeing that as like a super important part of, of that uh, last quarter. And uh, honestly, Cindy, it's because there's so much stuff out there yeah. that is either underused or not used or thrown away because it's not used. And then yet we're building new things next to it. Um, Can't we go back in like a hot rod and kind of gain that, uh, well, maybe patina, but also that history, you know, of the people that built it, the people that designed it, the people that lived in it. I think that's uh, like soul, that's like a soul of a building. And Mr. Steam is a perfect example of that. You know, maybe most people might say it's not a particularly attractive uh, building, whatever that means, because I don't know what that means. Right. Um, uh, you know, in, in the book, I talk in my, um, gra- uh, in my um, uh, distinguished whatever alumni award <laughs> speech, I talk about a professor that taught me something about um, assumption of what is ugly and what is not ugly. And it was really a fascinating exercise. I hope people read it because I just really think it was a turning point for me. And from that point on, I understood that nothing was really ugly, that everything had some worth, and that you, if you go into it like an explorer, like a mountain climber sort of, and you assemble something out of this existing situation, man, you can get some, you can get some fantastic uh, uh, results that you wouldn't necessarily get in a ground up building. Right. And, right, or the co- uh, like the columns, for instance, which are glorious. Exactly. They're fantastic. The other thing is, it's the most sustainable way of uh, of doing a building because the embodied energy is already there. No matter how hard you try to make a perfect new building sustainable, it's not the same as making an old building uh, with good with good systems. Um, into a into a good building, into a sustainable building. So, right. like, I think it's our future. I think yeah, I, I, really, you're like an explorer, you know. And oh, the yeah. building, and when you walk into that project, first of all, it's a great testament to this company too that's been around for such a long time, um, because working with you just like elevated everything, honestly. And just seeing how beautiful, as you say, what's ugly, yeah. what's not, uh, like it doesn't really matter. You see that you have sort of stripped it back and found the beauty um, and the function, obviously. Yeah, and and you're right, and you're making a good point about something. The only reason that happened was because of the client. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody else, uh, you know, the client came to me and said, hey, I'm interested in what you've done because of whatever. And it was clearly, you know, some of this sort of maybe industrial aesthetic or sort of this um, this, uh, uh, agenda on my part to always, uh, look at the nat- natural nature of the thing and, yeah. and, and, and embrace that. And for some reason, this client in Long Island City <laughs> called me in Seattle Hello. and said, I love your stuff. Come out here and do it. Are you interested? It's a small project. Are you even remotely interested in it? I go, of course I am. This is I like a perfect so, project. I know. I just thought that was like so wonderful. And it felt it felt very uh, random in a way, like he couldn't believe that you wanted to either. And it's fantastic. Yeah. The result is, is fantastic. Okay, yeah. so let's get to our third theme, which is architecture and nature, which is what you talk about all mm-hmm. the time. And there are some famous, famous Kundig houses in this chapter, like, like the Rio house um, that everyone's seen in Brazil, that's splendid. But the dragonfly one in Montana, I don't know that everyone knows about this project. Yeah, it's um, so 
it, it almost fits in dragonfly almost fits into the um, agenda of the cover in a way is is how do you respond and, and so does rio in a way all all the projects do how do you respond to the the local natural context i grew up in a natural context i grew up in spokane northern idaho you know uh well it's eastern washington northern idaho southern british columbia that landscape is so big that as a kid you can't help but to be somewhat uh, intimidate, not intimidated is not quite the word, word, but you sort of recognize that nature is a lot bigger than, than, than we are. So how, you know, in, in sort of a reverence, how do you sort of back away from trying to impose something on nature, but actually sort of blend in with nature? Dragonfly was very much that. If you look at the project, you'll see that the colors, the proportions, the way it floats through the forest, the mixed stand forest of, uh, of uh, uh, Whitefish, Montana, the way it um, picks up the horizon line and the lake line, you know, the water line as it floats through that forest, you know, and again, all the sort of columns and colors of the bark yes. um, and the shadows in the bark. It's intended to sort of, again, be a whisper into that, into that uh, landscape. Um, and uh, and then it also kind of opens and closes. You know, this was a client that very much is active outdoors, like like me. I'd rather be outside than inside. This, that's the way this client also, also was. So it actually, the house in a sense kind of can undress. You know, we, it can kind of open up big windows and big doors and kind of just breathe that that natural landscape of um, of uh, Western Montana. And then it also. Um, can close up because Montana is a true four season um, climate and there's an ability to then take this, you know, put the clothes back on and kind of cozy up and become a little more intimate. So that's the idea of, uh, well, it's one of the ideas of Dragonfly, how it opens and is in, uh, influenced by the nature of its place. Yeah, it's, it's wonderful. And the way you do that so seamlessly, so beautifully, um, like nobody else, honestly, Tom. Oh, we can't forget the Costa Rica house too that everyone has seen that also is like part of the landscape that is just, wow, right? Yeah, well, and of course, that's a, that's a different climate, slightly right, different totally. climate. That's a climate where you're in flip-flops and shorts and a exactly. t-shirt and you're, you're, you're hanging out, things that the breezes are going up and down, the surf's up, you're going down to the beach. Right. So the idea of that place is it is in a semi-tropic, totally comfortable place. Interesting thing about that project is that most of the wood was harvested um, out of uh, the local forest because it was an invasive species and that is teak. It was not a, well, not a particularly high grade um, teak, but uh, teak in Costa Rica in this area is invasive. So uh, you can take it out of the forest for, for nothing, uh, basically. Well, it costs something to take it out, but um, and then um, assemble a, a home in it. And so that was a dream project, frankly. Again, because it's almost like you're outside when you're inside. Right, and, and also just like you said, like exploring um, nature in all different settings, right? That's what you're a master mm -hmm. of, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and, well, I love I love nature, whatever <laughs> that, wherever it is. If it's up in Alaska, if it's down in Costa Rica, if it's over in Korea, if it's in, in Switzerland, it doesn't matter. Austria, or yeah, well, Austria, I'm doing something up in the mountains of wow. Austria, doing something, I finished something in Australia and New Zealand. Man, what a, what a honor to be able to engage our uh, globe, in a sense, culturally and environmentally. It's, it's been fantastic. Yeah, well, you're, you're definitely um, somebody that, uh, you know, I, I say this to, to students a lot because I say find an idol find an idol that you can follow and when I see a book like this I say like if you love Tom you got to get the book and dig in because it's personal to him like you're gonna see him all over this book and you can really really understand the process and as you say uh, the working title so kind of what's what's deeper behind all these projects and I'm excited. I want my signed copy, Tom. <laughs> uh, I think it's in the mail. Oh, Cindy. good. <laughs> I heard I that one before. That. Yeah, exactly. Well, we all have. Yeah. Right. No. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you'll definitely get your signed copy. <laughs> well, listen. I want to thank you for uh, getting up in the wee hours for this for this conversation, mm -hmm. and I'm sending you a big virtual hug. Congratulations on all your success. Please, please. 
uh, keep sharing it. We need it. We need leaders yeah. like you. And um, I'm very excited to really dig into every word in the book. Fantastic. Thanks again, Cindy. Okay. Sending my love. Say hi to Jim too. Say hi to Jim. Will do. Okay. Will do. Bye everybody. Thanks, Cindy. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. is really based on collage and about putting things together which not necessarily you would put together you know you'll find kind of weird things you'll find a big absurd round mirror sliding in front of a bookshelf you'll find colorful ribbons hanging from the ceiling and yet they all make sense together and that's what we love so it's not like expected we mm -hmm. hate expected things It might be nice to say your name. Well, in Italian it's okay. uh, Peter Ippolito. In German it's Peter Ippolito. And in American it's Peter Ippolito. <laughs> <laughs> Us Americans. Yeah, with my name it's easier. I'm going to flights. It's like the birds are singing Ippolito flights, right? Well, a lot of people think it's an it's a airline. <laughs> ah, yeah. oh, flights. Because they, yeah, flights. <laughs> Ippolito and flights, and yeah. not so easy names, but yeah, they sound good. They sound really, really good together. <laughs> So who sits where now? That's Gunter and that's, oh, that's me. Oh, okay. So, so Gunter is in control. <laughs> Gunter, you're in control? Okay. Well, basically, it's the perfect match of the two of them. Peter is an incredibly creative mastermind. Mm. He's never running out of ideas. And uh, he can be super persuasive, selling an idea to a client, mm. which they never really dreamed of. <laughs> and, <laughs> and is this jetzt schon sein Brandschutzkonzept, was er... Was well, Gunter actually really makes things happen. Sometimes the client becomes afraid of their own courage and we have to keep them and, and tr make them trust in the project. Uh, you have to focus then at the right time. That a new skin into the building, mm. which is made out of stainless steel. So how did you guys get to know each other? The first thing, it was by accident because I moved in Peter's apartment. But then Peter moved to, to Chicago. The world was full of opportunities and I had just simply no clue what to do. So I started trying things out. At one point, I just knew it's architecture. For me, it was pretty clear that I wanted to, to come into architecture. I, I was grown into a builder's family. We decided together to mm. just start a business right after diploma, pretty much. Everybody thought they are crazy. <laughs> but I think it was the energy we could find yeah. together. Yeah, it's more than 20 years now. Yeah. Uh, so it's kind of a long friendship, really. Yeah. We're in Stuttgart. We're in Stuttgart, oh my yeah. God. So it was rebuilt, you know, wow. that's like a typical thing. The first project we did together was an extension of an apartment. It got a lot of attention because it's just not a typically German apartment. Then we did an Italian restaurant, which was our first public project. The third is an is a advertising agency here in Stuttgart. Still today, uh, the interior informs the whole identity of, of the company. It's about telling a story which is very strong and exciting. We have always been very open-minded in working in very different uh, projects. And, you know, it can be retail, it can be workspace design, it can be hospitality. And I think that kind of kept us fresh. You know, we're not architects in the traditional sense anymore, you know, so it's kind of difficult to say I'm an architect. So we created that kind of claim for us, identity architect. How many projects, like, what's typical? Usually we're working on something like 40 or 50 projects at the same time. What? Yeah, the whole studio is yeah. trained to work very fast, you know. Mm. You have to switch perspectives all the time. Mm -hmm. So you go from really big scale into very detailed. We create little words around every single project. What is this? We are trying to make a window display which has quite a broad impact on, on the outside. So we're trying to do something which is very bright. Part of setting up our studio and uh, receiving so much uh, public interest was, you know, that we're one of the first ones who had a totally different approach to interior design okay. in, in Germany. They just broke the rules yeah, all over the exactly. place, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is the waiting zone. We 
can have a look at. Uh... Let's talk about that fifth surface. Ceilings are kind of a, a lost surface in modernism. The ceiling became really a place for sprinklers and lighting fixtures and air ducts <laughs> and whatever. And of course it needs to be there. But for us, ceilings are really a fantastic chance to create identity. If a restaurant is full, you, you don't see what is happening on the floor, but the ceiling is always visible. We uh, won the competition for the redesign of the Spiegel Kantine, and there was a difficult commission, you know, because there was one a Panton uh, as, you know, the design of the old Spiegel Kantine, and it became kind of the icon for the Spiegel. So we created that ceiling with like 4,300 aluminum plates, which kind of create exactly the same lighting effect as you would see it when the lights and the sun hits the water. The company is called Der Spiegel, which is the mirror, the most famous political magazine in Germany, and it's about reflection of opinions and setting the tone, the political debate. It was a perfect metaphor for that. Bella Italia Wines, which is the ceiling where we positioned uh, mirrors uh, on the ceiling which are, you know, like collected. We got to know Maria and she had her old wine shop. The restaurant is like a stage for her, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> stories we tell as architects in space, if they're complete stories, they're boring because you might like them or you might not like them. So we try only to give hints of a story. It triggers your imagination and you'll start to do your own story, and that's exactly what happens here. So now we're in Schorndorf. Schorndorf is a wonderful little old city uh, close to Stuttgart, and it's very famous because it's the birth city of Gottlieb Daimler, the inventor of the car engine and the founder of Mercedes, which we all know. Mercedes, yeah. yes. We have this beautiful landmark of the town hall here. In the original state, when they built it, it was open. Over the years, they closed it down, and now what we did is we made it transparent again and put the city council in there, so now they're really doing their business on the marketplace, and everybody can see them. It's uh, a strong political message, right? Yeah, exactly. We're going to put a lot of glass so that you yeah, see yeah. what's going on in our city. <laughs> <laughs> the people are really proud of this fantastic renovation. So that's, I think, the most mm. important yeah. Yeah. for a politician to show democracy yes. in the big hall. We're always hungry for new great projects. So it happened that we started more and more to work internationally. Of course, Uzbekistan, you know, being our, our craziest project probably for our lifetime. <laughs> This is the International Forum in, in Tashkent, in Uzbekistan. And this is what we had to achieve uh, in five and a half months. Oh my yeah. god. Actually, we were only commissioned for the interiors, but then, you know, we did the whole logistics of the site. Even the guts of it is beautiful, yeah. right? Incredible, incredible. Yeah. We're arriving at that site at night, and it's huge. It's <laughs> so huge, you know. Is it scary? Oh my it god, was totally scary. Was <laughs> five months for designing and realizing. It's a project which deals a lot about identity. Everybody visiting the space was fascinated of the new image, you know, Uzbekistan could, could find with this building. It's a, it's a very contemporary building, but it's a very Uzbekistan building. We never could build something like that here. Yeah, oh, so here. we have yeah. 4,800 workers on site. Wow. The this is Uzbekistan by the numbers, right? <laughs> oh so my god. We, we love that kind of working on eye level with everybody, not only us to the client, but same with all our collaborators, you know, with all our craftsmen. And that's part of our energy, that we love to do something together with somebody. This is not a typical engineering office, though. This was the intent, to hire these two guys. Yes. <laughs> we, had, we had a lot of discussion on Carlos. All the people who are living in the space or are using the space are changing it, you know. Design always has to be strong enough that people can make soft changes. That's something more than functional and beauty and good design. It's really about, you know. Uh, what we love in our work is that it's often about surprise, you know. As you know, we don't have a style, a design language that 
stays the same, but we, we always try to find individual solutions. And that's always fun because you find your language. We complement each other quite a bit. It's my kind of ping pong player, really. It, it's, a, it's a very natural way of, of, of how we do things together, which I love. Hey everybody, this is Cindy Allen, and you've just watched the documentary on Hall of Famers, Ippolito Flights, who were inducted in 2015. And today, fast forward five years, we're catching up with my good friends, Peter Ippolito and Gunther Flights from Ippolito Flights. Hi guys. Hi Cindy, Hello. good to see you. Hi, it's so great to see you. I have such strong memories of being in Stuttgart and filming together. Yeah, it was, it's a dear memory for us as well. You know, it's still a highlight <laughs> in our studio history. A absolutely. And, yeah. and, so, and so a lot has happened since then. So we're gonna, we're gonna like fast forward to today. And, you know, we've kept in touch with you, publishing you, you've won Best of Year awards. So I feel like we're still always together, but why don't you tell some folks, like maybe we should start with a project we just literally published right now well this is Rural work um headquarters it's a it's a workplace project and the uh, workplace you know became a really important part of our work here in germany as it's such a global transition of how we think about work and now of course that's being accelerated by by the the covid crisis as well so um uh it is really interesting for us as you know like 10 years ago workplace design was much about organizing desks you know Today it's right. about really creating uh, a place or a, a temple for purpose and for value, right? And even more now with the COVID crisis where we learn that home office is such a, a much easier thing than we expected, you know? And all the doubts we had and whether it's gonna work or not, they were like swept away within one day. And we experienced that in our studio and suddenly everybody experienced that. So it's kind of question, you know, the way how are we going to lay out a, a workplace? And it comes back to what the core of our business is, is working with identity. So today, you know, we're doing a lot of workplace projects, which are really about creating a place where um, people want to be and they don't need to be. So there needs to be a value in why people would go to the office. And, and so, you know, that project is a pretty good example for that. Werberg is a good example. You know, it's here in Stuttgart. Um, so they are manufacturers of, of paints. And it was, you know, it was finished uh, something like a year ago. Mm. Uh, but it's, you know, it's not, uh, it's a worldwide um, uh, acting company, but they really were, you know, before they have been, they are, they are doing paints for car industry, really special um, productions. And before, you know, in, in their culture, it was like um, they had their corporate and it was like more like a laboratory, like, you know, gray and, you know, but we, they were so open-minded and um, the whole program we developed with them uh, as consultants was really great because they have been, um, you know, the whole building is like, a, like their culture being, being placed there. So for example, in the, in the ground floor, visitors come in and they are in the middle of an exhibition uh, getting to know the brand and at the same time there is the cafe for everybody so it's not only for you know people working there it's for all the guests it's for all the workers in the production so the mindset is really um, a welcome gesture for everyone we were excited about thinking about this color palette like you know like a color card and making a roof um, out of different colors and we we could organize a fantastic um color scheme, um, every, every level different, every neighborhood different. They work mainly for the automotive industry, right? So as you say, there's a certain palette of colors, but you took them way out of what I would say would be a comfort zone, right? So how did, how did they handle that? Uh, that's the beauty, right? Look, in the area we, we, we have our studio here in Stuttgart, um, there's a lot of hidden champions, first of all, you know? mid-sized companies, you wouldn't know necessarily, but they're on the global landscape and doing really, really high-end engineering work. And that's one, one of these companies. And they have a one advantage versus the big corporate uh, clients we have. You have an owner, right? And you can ignite them and you can excite them and they'll really go for it. And suddenly, you know, they realize that they'll have to look differently into the workplace. And so 
they they really are open if you if they, if you gain their trust and I think that's always you know for everybody the core of what we do is that we that that you really can go a far way with them. So they really understood it's not about workplace, it's about communication and it's about culture. So the whole place becomes a display of what they are, what they do, how they do things. And the whole ground floor, as Kunta said, becomes a place for communication, not only for the guys going there, whether it's a visitor or somebody works there, but for everybody passing by. And they become like a really uh, an engine for a transformation, which I think goes far beyond that company itself, right? And that's that's super exciting, I think. Yeah, it looks, it looks like an art installation for whoever drives by. Yes, and, exactly. and what's so interesting, um, Gunter, you were saying, so up on the other floors, it's almost like you knew COVID was going to happen because the way, you, the way you created the office space, which is still open, but has these beautiful colored panels, again, situated all the way throughout the office. They came out of single offices and team offices. So, of course, there's always this concern of being um, working in an open environment, there is, um, it's important that people really um, are integrated in the whole change management process. So that's something we did parallelly, of course. So people didn't, have not been surprised. They have been part of the process we have been doing together. That's one, uh, it's all about the communication of what's coming for them in the future. And um, what was really important that it was all about well-being. It was about, you know, they, they kind of get their home within Burbach. Um, of course, you know, some people, you know, you can discuss about colors, you know, like ages. So it's, of, of course, some, some uh, team members said afterwards, well, I would like to sit there more in the other, in the, in the other area because, you know, right. the color um, rhythm there I, um, I like better. But I think it was all about um, creating a space where, uh, you know, these, uh, these ceiling elements we did, they are cooling and, and, and the color code. So it's different neighborhoods. People can really identify um, and uh, they create a sense of belonging to, to their team area. And, uh, you know, it's, it's also about, you know, the dividers we had uh, in between the tables. So it's really about an open space, but a good mixture of um, feeling also really safe and, and um, concentrated in, in other rooms where you can close the door. So it's not only about open space, but it's also about concentration. And uh, so the open areas are all process areas and, and, and there's a large amount of, of, of spaces where you can hide away and, and, and be for yourself. The strong purple ceiling is, is stunning, but like getting people to say yes to that and also the beautiful graduation of it. Oh my God, yeah. how did you get them to say yes? Well, you know what, there was one of our first major projects like 20 years ago was an was a advertising agency. And uh, um, our first large project, you know, and, and we designed a really, really bold, colorful, multicolor project. And it was a really a magic moment, which we learned a lot from because we printed it to the guys and these are like high-end creatives and they all have their own types. Right. And they looked and, you know, they're like, you know, the classic heterosexual guy, you know, there was a lot of pink in there and so on, you know. And so like I presented that and they were like, oh my God, first. And then within a minute, they said, you know what, we're not going to discuss it because you know, that's what you bring, that the concept is good and, and we're going to go for that. And that always, you know, we always have that in mind, you know. So if you have a concept, and it's a basic question, you know, like if you have a concept, um, you can go a long way because you're not going to start discussing details, you know, because it's the idea which counts and, and that was the same situation here. They didn't question the single color. They, the discussion was about, is that what we are? Is that what we want to promote as a, as a, as a work environment for our, for our next 20 years? Um, um, is that giving us a framework where people can grow and be part of our culture and where we want to uh, not only focus on, on office work, but also, also, as Gunther said, for the workers in the, in the factory, which are going to come to that, to that place and it's becoming a mixture, which is, again, a, a, a positioning, you know, which is, which is quite brave for a company like that. You know, it's a, it's a statement, really. And uh, so, no, they didn't discuss color. <laughs> Yeah, and the good thing is, you know, our material library, um, um, when you've been here to Stuttgart, you know, we have really um, a great team uh, with um, color and material expertise. And in this case, the client was, you know, we, our, all team members have been passionate, but 
you know if you if you finally uh, show off with the materials you need a brave client in this case yes they kind of they didn't think about something like that but you know if you then have the material consultant who's really like um, convincing and, and specialist in uh, specialist in that um, yeah that helps you you know you, you don't get any discussions um, because she was so convincing also in, in, in finalizing the yeah the, the materials that have been chosen in the end and people with in this case there's a lot about participation sometimes um, but in this case the color decisions have all been uh, taken by, by the design team and they were accepted by the by the small team. But that's a good point. You know, when we when we extended our studio uh, a year ago, we created a fabulous material lab um, here in Stuttgart, and it's like a paradise. You know, it's like a magic place with thousands, we believe, thousands of materials, and we're really proud of that. And we have uh, uh, guys only working with materials and sourcing new materials and products and. and uh, some of them are textile design. Is it in the same building, Peter? Is it in the, it's same, in the same building? It's the basement, or like the ground floor. Yeah? Fantastic. And so it's, it used to be the art gallery, and now it's our, our, yeah. our third level. And this is really a magic place, and it really works, you know, because you go there with the client, and they'll, they become like little kids um, playing a day with colors and materials, and they're going to be part of the design process. And that helps, of course, you know. It's all about, you know, participation, and they'll feel being part of the decision making, they can change things, we'll discuss things, you can see it right away, we can adjust the light to any kind of temperature, to any kind of uh, uh, brightness. And so we can really simulate certain situation and that's a fantastic situation. That's amazing. And you know, look, I'm so always so excited by your projects. First of all, you get the clients in 100% and it shows in the project. I can't imagine what it must be like for them right now to have like a really special, space that like you said that really is about culture because this is what we hear right now all the time that that companies don't want to lose the culture culture is what helps build their brand so i'm i'm so happy to be able to show that project right now during what we're going through uh, i want to talk about uh speaking of materials i want to talk about something else exciting that you're working on or just finishing up that is unbelievable talking about going full throttle this uh this line of carpet with object carpet. That's really like, again, like an art installation, the way you're marketing it and showing the product. Now that's, that's a beautiful project. And, and ah. you know, part of, as you know, part of our, our story was always that we're thinking in long-term partnerships and object carpet is a really good example. And so we, for the past three years, we worked really intensely and it got a little bit out of hand, I have to say. And we thought it's like a project of a couple of months and it ended to be a three-year project. So we had like uh, 250 colorways and then we had to cut it down to 100. Edit, edit, edit. And that's what now the, the, the collection is about. But it was a beautiful process where, uh, and that's what we like. Um, it's a win-win situation for both sides. You know, we learned a tremendous amount of, uh, of things. That project, um, I think the manufacturer of the carpet learned a lot because, you know, of course they invited us because we thinking from space and from the use of right. their product. And so um, it was a super exciting project to create a collection of, of carpets, which is not the classic functional office carpet. Uh, the, the working title for us was the new, the new uh, textile lust, right? There was an installation a couple of years ago um, by Rudolf Stingel, an Austrian artist in the Venice Biennale. And he cladded the whole Palazzo Grassi uh, in Venice, floor, wall, ceiling with carpet. And that was like a little bit the starting point of that. Um, to think about carpet as something which really has the potential as a textile surface to really enclose you, which is not only a functional surface, but something which has a character to it. So we spend a lot of time of these three years, we spend in creating a mistake in something which is supposed to be perfect because it's an industrial product. And so we created something which for a lot of the products, it looks artisanal, it looks like handmade, it has a much more like a handmade quality to it. And you wouldn't believe it's an industrial product, not if you see it and not if you see the price. Um, so um, that was really a, a, a beautiful way because it's really about a textile and a haptic experience, uh, which gives really personality to the space on one hand. And on the other hand, of course, having an intelligence of a product um, 
which colorways you can freely combine without problems with all the sustainability which you know a product of today needs to have in terms of materiality in terms of how you get rid of it after the life cycle and all these things and we're really incredibly excited about that uh, collection and then of course it was fantastic to have the trust of object carpet to really give us not only the job for the collection but to do the marketing as well so we did the whole uh, communication concept hired uh, a really fantastic photographer monica maness who did like an outstanding series of uh, films and uh, and and photographs for that uh, which really shows i think the whole pleasure of everybody involved in that process working on that collection and and and, and the direction so far is really gigantic right yeah yeah good what what was that like doing because you can tell you had an amazing time doing the marketing side of it <laughs> you know the the thing was of course uh, it should be the launch of the product should have been in my in milan you know like uh, ah. this April. and of course it was uh, disappointed uh, disappointing that we realized a couple of months before that that couldn't happen we spent a lot of time uh, in 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 the development of this of this uh, carpet collection and of course it was great to convince the client that we have to think about different formats of communicating because you know milan didn't happen and that was the big right. thing we wanted to do roadshow and other formats but they all cannot happen in the next month mm -hmm. that's why it was so so great that we could do um the whole communication uh, with a film and all the other um things that have been uh, important that uh, anyhow this uh, collection gets a great audience you know and i think um our team is was really good in in thinking about different ways of of how new products can be um experienced without without um, um seeing them live and i think that was a good that was a, a good example no, the, we, we're the, the, it's a fantastic client. It's a great, great partnership, you know. So we convinced the client to to rent space, and we set up like a mini version of our supposed Milan installation, and used that time to do all the trainings for the for the sales reps, and then we went in and took still photographs. We did film and we did a high res 3D movie which is going to be interactive because the beauty was that the installation was interactive. So you touch the carpet with your hand and something would happen and the carpet would talk to you. And it was such a shame that we oh. couldn't do that in Milan, right? I we know. Like so devastated. I'm so sorry. But you know what? This is going to get a lot of attention. First, I think so of, too, all, yeah. first of all, the product itself. And then, and then the way, just the way you guys imagine, uh, any kind of future, you imagine something that, you know, makes us pause, makes us excited, makes us children, makes us want to play, like all those things. It's so, it's so beautiful. Tell us a little bit um, about the fact that you were so much more ready um, for COVID because of all your work in China. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, um, because of the lockdown in Shanghai, which was a couple of weeks before we got it in Europe, we have been quite well prepared. Um, parts of our team um, organized everything. So we we have been, you know, we didn't do any homework before besides the people who have been traveling. So, you know, because our work is quite emotional and physical, like with the materials and, and the whole process is, is based on communication. But, you know, we decided next week we go um, uh, uh, to work from home and really the it worked so well you know with the with uh, with the communication skills we improved and with our clients you know we got new clients in that period we never met them personally the last month but you know you did the whole design package within the, the these months since march and it worked as well so i think there is there will there will also stay um new formats of, of working together i know you guys were sort of ready for it in a way that a yeah. lot of people weren't so it was it was really good news to hear that peter what you were telling me and as kunta says you know it's been really an amazing amazing experience in any respect you know in, in the respect of the experience to work remote in the in respects of um the team spirit and how we belong together and how people take care of each other within the studio as much as with our clients and the relationship with our clients and and uh, last but not least, you know, in the amount of work we gained within the last month, although we have a difficult situation, not only in China, 
um, which is really, as I said last time, you know, a, a, a remarkable movement right now for us. You know, we, we are really expanding uh, strongly in China and we get so much right. work after they went out of home uh, office, um, but as well in Europe. And, and so that's for us, it's a really good experience. Tell us a few more of the workplace. I know you're working on a bunch of headquarters. What's some of the work that you're doing right now? Well, um, the, the workplace projects we're doing are, are, are really from, from uh, all different sizes. So we'll do the headquarters for Rittersport, as well as the headquarters for Bionade. I know we are working on a couple of high-rise projects, mostly in high-end residential. So one, one of them is for Grosse Partner in, in Frankfurt. It's uh, the four. It's the biggest um, development in Frankfurt. There we do the residential towers. We're doing um, two shopping malls. We are doing five-star hotels. We're doing small resorts. We're doing a lot of workplace projects. We do a couple of really exciting in, uh, interiors for residential projects. Well, the Ippolito flights with all scales, they don't care. They, they, yeah. they can do anything and they do do anything. And it's always inspirational. It's always uplifting. We expect you to help lead us in terms of what the future of workplace will look like. There's no question about that. So I really, I really want to thank you guys for like digging in and um, big hugs. Thank you guys. Thank you guys thank so you much. Thank you for the uh, yeah. see you soon. Curious about new directions, new possibilities, new social organizations, different ways to aggregate materials, etc. And so as a result, we're always looking for the curiosity and the pleasure of invention. I'd love to try to get to the heart of, mm -hmm. there's three of you, mm -hmm. two are twins. How does that work? Look, the <laughs> question is who's going to start first? <laughs> <laughs> The nature of our practice is always in one foregrounding what are the rules, what are the expectations. If you can frame the project, you can frame the practice in a way that's declarative, then you're in a much better position to be able to produce a collaborative endeavor so that the best idea can win. David, what was it like growing up? We grew up in a kind of an interesting household. Building, drawing, making, really having to make, make your way in the world. So the assumption was that you would look at the world around you and create it. And Mark, were you a rambunctious creative kid? I don't think I was ever rambunctious. <laughs> um, but I think from a very early age, I was kind of usually sitting somewhere with a pad of paper, sketching and, and drawing. That, I think, obsession with drawing has remain really as part of the kind of DNA of the firm. Paul and I met in graduate school at Princeton and I graduated a year earlier um, because I was smarter. Uh, yeah. But yeah then, you know, um, and then David ended up um, arriving at Princeton pretty much on Paul's heels. But then you all ended up getting together, yeah. right? We had basically convinced Storefront that we had this body of work, which we didn't Get actually attack, have, right? Yeah. right? So, oh, this uh, is the age-old yeah, story. Yeah. So no, we, like, we conceptualized we, it. We, yeah, we, we, we knew that it was it possible, was there. so <laughs> burdened by our own hubris. And we had to then actually produce this effectively six or eight thesis projects in the course of six months. Um, but that How was did really that turn out? Mm -hmm. so. Oh, it turned out well. I mean, clearly, yeah. so. The first series of our built projects were small-scale restaurants. And in each of those, the curiosity was how we could actually work with relatively cheap materials, aggregating them to a kind of point of excess that would produce effects that would be unprecedented and yet oddly familiar. I will never, ever, ever forget Fluff. Yeah and Tides. Yeah. They were yeah. spectacular. Tides is mm, yeah. a great tides. example. Oh yeah. my God. And that was, you know, using 110,000 ordinary bamboo skewers. So all together, 
you are just... Yeah, we're just complete control freaks yeah, at that level. Yeah, but, but I think there's control yeah. freaks that are about eliminating chance and curiosity yeah, and right. about You're the kind of rigor. Of that. We want to actually go. trigger pleasure in the unknown, but to do so rigorously. So, welcome to Poster House. This is amazing, you guys. When we first came to the space, sort of see the barrel vaults, the brick walls, the kind of exposed architecture of the cast iron columns and realize that we really wanted to take advantage of that, the sort of architectural equivalent of like a split screen condition. It is like a, a split, yeah, right. right. The project really is just two intersecting lines and they of course intersect at the door to the gallery. One of the interesting challenges of this space is that the floor actually it's slopes. Like this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it slopes two and a half feet from 23rd Street to 24th Street. It's a challenge from a constructional standpoint and a functional standpoint to deal with the continuously sloping floor. Good thing you guys are optimists. Yeah. <laughs> Good thing you take every challenge and say, what can we do? I mean, you guys are hardcore architects, primarily doing interiors. So I think for us what's sort of critical about the interior is that it really is the kind of stage for human experience, for interaction, for the construction of community and collectivity. So we've always felt that the inside was a site for design that needs to be played out at, at the highest level. And a lot of the projects that we've taken on are, are public and they're accessible. You have really changed the face of education. Yeah. So we're going to go in a row, just going to start naming the yeah. schools. University of Wyoming. Cornell University. Claremont University Consortium. NYU. Vassar College. Gallaudet University. Helen Walton Early Childhood Education Center. The College of Worcester. Brown University. Syracuse University. Carnegie Mellon University. Columbia University. That's a lot. Uh, that is lot. crazy. Yeah. Okay, guys, this is a wowser. You are in many historic buildings, right? right? right. So that's a challenge mm -hmm. right. and an opportunity, yeah. right? In order to acknowledge the kind of qualities of McKinney and White, we need to celebrate the characteristics that right. are important, the windows, right. but to not somehow return it back to a period that it doesn't make sense anymore. Right. There are mechanical systems that we had to accommodate and there was just a flat, low ceiling. So what we did was to tip up the edges of that ceiling and you can see the kind of folded surface that yes. opens up towards the windows. This sort of interchange between old and new actually make the projects much richer. So yes. it's something we really try to celebrate. Did you collectively say, we're, this is where we're heading? We were already invested in education as teachers. There was an alignment between both our, our goals as educators and our interests as architects in the social dimension to sure. play them together right. through focusing on university work. Is there something that each one of you brings to the project? I think Mark brings by far the best hand, the, the capacity to visualize the world through drawing. Uh -huh. And Paul is the skeptical one who is always asking the question like, so what? Is this sufficient? And then what does David bring to the table? Well, nothing. No, 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 no. He's able to talk about us. Right. That's, what, yeah. That's his role. Uh, David brings a kind of greater technical curiosity to the table than mm -hmm. either of us do bring. And David's very good at stepping back and of saying, all right, how do we do this? What are we doing? Why are we doing it? Although obviously there are different skills and focuses and emphases that we bring to the table, we all really would want to be at that table engaging in the kind of design process as much as we can. You dig way deep. Yeah. Like you go in and you, yeah. you work it. One of the things that's consistent with all of our work is that we're less interested in perpetuating known models, the way things have been done in the past. We're not conservative in that sense. We're curious about new directions. What happens after it's done? What's, mm -hmm. what's the pleasure principle on this for you? I would say that for me the most delightful moment is walking in into a project during construction. That's in some ways uh, for me the, the moment in which 
uh, the hopes and aspirations to the, the challenges and difficulties of any project uh, gets assumed by its possibility. There is a kind of, kind of direct and immediate kind of contact that happens for me with mm. kind of working through you know, many forms of hand drawing when suddenly is like a, an aha moment. So the, right. the eureka moment that's both logical but also you know, completely fantastic at the same time. You know, architecture is the art that's perceived in a state of distraction. In other words, it's all around us all the time. So when we think about a door, well, what does that mean? And how can we actually rethink the door? So LTL, are you most satisfied walking through the door? <laughs> or walking out the door. <laughs> or, and, or walking into the door. <laughs> Okay, so hi everybody, this is Cindy Allen, Editor-in-Chief of Interior Design, and we are back after that amazing documentary um, with LTL. And I have the whole trio here, which first of all, thank you guys so much, because I know you're all teaching and it was hard to wrangle you all, but I was so, I'm was i so happy to see all your faces. Um, so it's Lewis, Paul Lewis, Mark Suramaki. So maybe raise your hands just so everyone knows. So it's Paul Lewis, Paul, Mark, Suramaki, and David Lewis, the twin. Yeah, because you know what, in the documentary, I'm like, we, it's like up there, but I'm like, people probably don't know who's who, and, <laughs> and it's tricky, it's tricky anyway. Um, but how are you guys doing? We're, we're doing pretty well. I mean, it's, it's hard to answer that question with our usual enthusiasm. Right. Um, but uh, no, we're, we're, we personally, I think we're, we're, we're doing fine. I think we're as everyone is, we're extremely anxious and worried and concerned. And um, this is unprecedented territory, as we all know, and just trying to figure out how to maintain the optimism, maintain the moving forward, while recognizing the severity of the, the world we're all inhabiting at the moment. Right, right. A lot of people, well, most people wouldn't know that during this period of time, you also moved your offices, which is also an, like, which is hard to do, right? So are you in your I know you're not in them now, but have you physically moved? No, we're we're in that we're in that process, that transition oh. period. So um, add some complexity to it. So. <laughs> oh, yeah. What are you supposed to be moving? Uh, we're looking at the end of June, ah. so we have a little bit of time. So yeah. Yeah, and Mark, like, how long were you in that in the old office? We've been there for, uh, well, I always get this wrong, but I think close to 10 years now, actually. Um, and um, we had previously been um, for about five years in a, a kind of collective space down on Essex Street in the Lower East Side. And, and now we're really just in this process of, of kind of looking for a new venue and locating that when everything obviously shifted from uh, business as usual to being completely disrupted by the current situation. So like many other things um, in our, you know, professional, collective professional um, and personal lives, it's, it's, um, it's in a little bit of a sus suspended state at the moment. Yeah. And David, so you were saying you're, you're upstate in, mm -hmm. in... Just outside of Ithaca. Yeah. Uh -huh. So where is everybody? So you're upstate with your family. Paul? Downtown New York City, so yeah. And I'm, uh, I'm here in New York City as well, just off of Union Square. So. Now it must be hard for you guys because um, one thing that became very clear when we worked on the documentary is first of all, how close you all are, but also how close your families are, right? And you spend time together. So what's, what's it been like being separated? Well, we, the separation is being offset by uh, excessive use of uh, digital forms of communication uh, and, and new types of uh, social collaboration, let's put it that way, such as uh, a, a Saturday evening talent show, three minutes to show your talent with, um, all, I think, 20 plus families all looking uh, to see what you can do. He's, he got three minutes. So that was pretty interesting. So there's been, uh, as a kind of uh, testament to the generative capacity of the human species, it's, a, it's amazing what are the events that are being created uh, Mark, in lieu of personal connection. Mark, who won? What, what, who was the winner? <laughs> there were no winners. <laughs> it was not me, that's for certain. Not, not the adults. <laughs> no, no, no. Not, not. Well, there was one adult who probably 
probably one, but yeah. <laughs> not, well, not, some, not among the three of us. Some of us take it more seriously than others. David and his son managed to figure out this system where they had pre-sketched um, a image of the Mona Lisa and in the requisite time everyone had, they simulated the act of drawing this thing. So each version came up, here's after 10 seconds, like, that's not possible. How did you do that in 10 <laughs> seconds? And then in 30 seconds, the entire Mona Lisa was drawn. How did you do that? So it's like, yeah. So. You're a cheater, David. You no, it wasn't cheating. It's called planning. It's called magic. Oh, oh I, <laughs> see. I, I see. I see. Well, we, we had such a great time together putting putting that documentary get together. And the thing is, you know, you're such, you're so serious um, about the work, which we love. And I say almost like moral guardians of the industry, but you also have so much fun together. And I love that that came out in the documentary. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and that, that was, was it was really great to make and and really fun to see because of course, as you know, Cindy, you spend you know several hours talking and and visiting projects and having these conversations. You're never quite sure what's ultimately going to end up in the the final product. And we were super pleased to um, to kind of see what you all were were able to shape it into, which was really kind of fantastic from our standpoint and. And in a way, that aspect of things, you know, it is so Im important to us that, you know, yes. the, 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 you know, the humor, the, the kind of uh, maybe surreality of things. And in a way, <laughs> no more so than now do we need to um, keep some form of sense of humor operative to kind of, uh, you know, make it through the kind of strange new world that we're all trying to navigate. Yeah, you know, it, it made me think about the fact that we were all celebrating in the Javits, and um, it was so special because your, you know, your all of your family with it were together right. and there, and it was so beautiful to see that. And then right now, that Javits has been turned into a hospital per se, and yeah. that it creates like new meaning for the feeling of all of us being there, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. No, and it, it speaks to both the adaptability of the city, but also some of the difficulties that cities are, you know, in particular New York and frankly, all major cities are going to be, you know, dealing with in the short term, the medium term and long term. I mean, we, we love the city because of its density, because of the culture that's produced, the exchange, the Javits events, a great example. And that's precisely what cannot happen now. Uh, we need to make sure that we're vigilant to make sure that it returns because that's so fundamental to what we do. Yeah, yeah it's, it's very strange. It's, it's the city on the one hand, if you look out the window, physically looks the same, but it's fundamentally and profoundly altered. It's, it's silent. It's um, still uh, in this kind of uncanny way. And you kind of really realize um, maybe as maybe one of the few side benefits of this unfortunate situation, how much you value the kind of proximity, the density, the kind of chance encounter, the, all of the kind of contingencies um, that make living in a city so vital um, and for us so incredibly valuable. Yeah, David, you and I are probably luckier because we're both like kind of out of the city right now. Mm -hmm. But then when I see these images, these desolate images of the city, you know, empty. It's just hard to imagine that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it's, 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 uh, but it also casts into a perspective of kind of, uh, it's been interesting to read and to think back upon the historical role that architecture has played in the recon reconstruction of the cities uh, to deal with uh, questions of hygiene, questions of um, uh, transmittable diseases whether it was tuberculosis, whether it was modern insistence right. upon uh, essentially transforming dense, really, really dense uh, dwellings, slums or otherwise for reasons of hygiene. And that in many ways were, were the cities, the modern Western cities are set up in much better situation than they were 100, 120, 100 years ago to be able to address things. So the, what, what I think has been most in the last couple of days really striking is seeing images coming out uh, of India and other places where that assumption of a kind of base level of dwelling that is embedded in our codes, but it's why the codes are there, yes. um, doesn't exist. Right. Uh, and right. that's, that's going to be, uh, you know, we tend to lament the isolation, but on the other hand, the isolation has a certain built-in um, 
uh, separation that right. is in, embedded in the way in which we understand how many people can live in an apartment and, so, yep. and what yeah. constitutes a bedroom. Yeah, I, I, um, I want to talk about education because all of you are teachers mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, what's ha I've been, I've also read um, some schools have reached out to me about helping in some way because now they're all going online to do classes and I'm interested in your perspective as being teachers and what the schools that you're, um, that you have the relationship with what's happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I'll speak specifically about um, Princeton. And, you know, I think it's um, the remote learning, the setup is, is not natural to the very models of campuses, much like isolation is not natural to the model of cities. Um, that being said, I've been, um, you know, and the obvious deficiencies that come with that, the, the lack of the social exchange, the camaraderie, et cetera. Right. Um, we do have a distinct advantage, I think, in the design world in that we do work through mediums and namely mediums of drawing. And so even though we don't have the face-to-face -face that we used to have, we have the Zoom context, uh, I've found that uh, studio education um, that takes place through drawings actually goes pretty well. And uh, working with our interfaces of touch screens and being able to sketch, it's actually intensified the role of the drawing. Um, mm -hmm. Students bring their drawings up, uh, all of the critics can weigh in, they can circle things. We can, in a sense, talk through the drawing in a way, uh, and what I mean, drawing them loosely, you know, it could be rhino models, it could be right. computer models, et cetera, but work through the medium of that representation because that's not only the subject matter, but it's also the very thing that we're altering through our drawings and notations. That's actually been really effective, um, mm -hmm. really effective. Uh, I don't think it's better, but it's different right. and it has some real qualities that I think um, um, are, I'd be interested to see how that starts to influence when we return, if we return, when that happens, uh, to the education models that were already in place. Yeah, I think you guys would be very adept at dealing with that because you are so used to being in the process, right? right. Wherever that kind of process is. And I think your knowledge on that is, is going to be very, very helpful. Mark, what's, what's, your, um, what's your experience been? Yeah, no, I think similarly. I think um, what is challenging and what I think all the, all the schools in different ways are grappling with is how to replace, for example, studio culture, right? And so there is the physical proximity that, that is so kind of intrinsic to architectural education um, and in some ways unique to it that really just has to do with everyone being co-located within a single space, within a, you know, a large studio where you're constantly overlooking either accidentally or intentionally what's happening at the next desk, right? And in the next studio that happens to be, you know, a few desks away. And that the sort of accidental transmission that occurs through that, the kind of incidental exchange is, is for me, like one of the most valuable aspects of architectural education. And, and I think, you know, at, at, at GSAP now, we have the, the they've invented uh, the idea of the virtual studio, right? So in a way, what's supplementing and supplanting that physical space is a kind of virtual facsimile of it, where the products of the studio in an ongoing way are visible to everyone and it's publicly accessible. Other studios can view it. There, and there can be similar kinds of exchanges. I just got an email from a student, a student in a seminar that I'm doing on drawing um, and, uh, and he said, you know, um, I, can we actually just have a, a, a collective folder where I can see everybody else's drawings mm -hmm. and we can all sort of exchange and view one another's work. So, you know, and, which I think, um, you know, is, is, is super important. And I think the students recognize the value of that as much as we do. Um, and both students and um, schools, I think, are being inventive and creative in the ways to allow that kind of exchange to continue to happen even in the absence of physical proximity. Yeah. Hey, yeah. hey David, um, mm -hmm. because I want to make sure we show a little inspiration, are there a few, because um, we need the inspiration, right? Mm -hmm. So are there a few uh, projects that um, you're working on or something that we, that we can share with everybody or something that just got finished? 
In terms of teaching or as no, a no, practice? just in terms of project in the practice, yeah. In terms of project, yeah, I mean, there's uh, in terms of the professional practice, we've continued to to work through this as most offices move pretty quickly to remote. We've been able to continue working on, say, a fairly uh, important project for the transformation of a Carnegie Library in Brownsville mm. for the for the design excellence, and that we met at design development uh, submission. And we're unfortunately the Department of Design and Construction has uh, had to put a lot of work, all the work on hold. Um, but we're we're able to continue working on, on on those pieces and pretty excited about what might happen after uh, things settle out. So so one of the things that's interesting in being in in a kind of digital uh, only form of communication is that the, the the inability to be able to really deal with the kind of physical raises its uh, its value uh, in really interesting ways. And so uh, we've been in the studio at Parsons that I've been working on to transform the American house by doing hemp and lime construction as opposed to petroleum based. And this is working with okay. John Sar, Ruth and Allison Mears at the Healthy Materials Lab. We can't, we were planning on doing this week a full build, like a prototypical build, but you can't do that. Do it. So can't that hand on knowledge isn't possible. So we're trying to supplement it with YouTube videos and you know, if you can get a hold of something, but that, but it also, uh, an interesting way from a teaching standpoint says there's an incredible value to that and its lack raises its greater importance that I hope will uh, uh, bring it more to the fore as opposed to shift it to the side as, as hopefully we get back to uh, a more social form of uh, teaching as opposed to remote. And that's, and that's something that you guys are so, you know, ready to do, because that's like kind of your DNA, right? Give us a really, really hard problem. Take it all away and we're going to figure it out. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the, 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 I think part of, part of what's in, the interesting moment here is there's a kind of removal of things, which mm -hmm. allows a kind of invention, but it also, I think, should also point out, well, what is, what's lacking in that that we need to hold on to and reevaluate something you take for granted something that you assume is being always there and that has to do with practice as well as i think with, with daily life and the way in which we value healthcare, we value public space uh we value you know um, the right to have a living wage right right well we certainly value you guys and also your brilliant thinking about it and mm -hmm. that you can that you continue to you can be some of the leaders that help shape the future of mm -hmm. What, what it's going to look like on the other side. I depend on you yeah. for that. Um, <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. Just, okay, so you only have one sentence. Just to the viewers out there, just one thing you want to say, one piece of positivity and hope. He's pregnant. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> okay, Paul. Looks like you were going to say something, Paul. Yeah. I, well, <laughs> I want to, I I, you know, if you design really matters and matters now more than it ever has even though the typical formats we're used to using for design and the social settings that we we value relative to that may be on hold um, i think that more than ever design whether it's at the level of product or at the level of urban space is going to be even more essential as we work through the challenges presented by um, by this pandemic and in particular trying to reinforce the, the, um, the importance of density relative to the cultures that we value. Yes, I agree. Mark? Yeah, I think that was more than one sentence, Paul. But, yeah, that um, was. I but try. Mark, you usually do a lot more than one sentence. So you <laughs> try, true. you that try. True. No, I, I was just gonna to build on that. And I, I think, you know, one of the things that has become extremely evident during the last few weeks is um, you know, we've always had an office, as an office, have had a commitment to the value of um, the social dimensions of space, right? Mm -hmm. And that um, architecture for us doesn't exist outside of inhabitation, outside of um, community and collectivity at some level. And that's what we're all, I think, sorely missing now and, and you know, trying to recreate in, in a kind of uh, digital form, but uh, you know, I think uh, if nothing else, this situation really points to how vital that is, and how 
um, mutually in interdependent we are, how uh, uh, sort of necessary it is for us to have um, the kinds of uh, exchanges, the kinds of um, let's say communal experiences, um, the kinds of ex the in interchange um, that um, that we think that um, our architecture can uh, help to provide that can can contribute to in in many kind of valid ways. And I think what's been you know starting to uh, really fascinate us is what happens now and when um, something approximating normalcy begins to return to places like New York City. Um, how do we orchestrate that, right? Um, in the face of ne what's necessarily going to be an, a somewhat anxious and and tenuous situation, and and I think, um, you know, as architects and as, as designers and as thinkers about all those subjects, we're really um, uh, kind of fascinated at um, looking at how um, we can can engage in that in that dialogue. Yes, yeah, that was definitely longer than a sentence. I know, I know. I know. <laughs> Okay, David. <laughs> I, mean, I, I think one of the one of if you look at this from the standpoint of how does how does a crisis like this uh, put into perspective values uh, and and reestablish a kind of importance, one of human connection um, that Marx has talked about yeah. the, the the social space. But I also think in terms of you know, th things that can be generative and transformative from the city. Uh, placing a greater emphasis, for instance, upon ways in which the the quiet of the city is a is a benefit. The way in which you use a public space uh, for non automobile forms of transportation changes how you how you think of the city from a livable standpoint. And I think there there is a way to draw upon the, the radical change to understand that change can be made, if you will it. Um, and this is change done in reaction, but we can we take the same thing and do it as proactive because of the ca uh, capacity to make significant um, and fairly dramatic, in this case, a kind of reactive, but uh, can we use that same will and collective desire to change for better and for more um, desired purposes? And I think that's, that's for me one of the things most uh, enticing and uh, illustrative drawing from our current condition. Yeah, and and we think we can, right? We think yeah. we can. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And we definitely. I really appreciate um, you three because you you are so thoughtful and um, and also so creative about your thinking. And so we're definitely going to need you. And mm -hmm. um, I'm going to be doing more things. So maybe some of you will be in yeah. some roundtables if you if you have the time. But I did. Uh, I did need you um, mm -hmm. and want to sincerely thank you. Um, Paul Lewis, Mark Zermaki, and David Lewis, um, LTL, all their right. words of wisdom. Sending you yep. big virtual hug, yep. you guys. Virtual Likewise. hugs. Likewise. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Cindy. Thank, Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Are you watching the Hall of Fame Film Festival? The best new show to binge watch and then share with your best friend. You know, I spent a lot of time drawing because I couldn't speak very well when I was a kid. My parents thought I was a mute. Uh, I didn't talk till I was five years old. So I always using art as it's, it's a way to communicate with, with, with people. So then, of course, when I came here, I couldn't speak very well because I couldn't speak the language. I can go back to my first day in primary school, and the, the teachers are so nice, so soft-spoken, and pat you in the back. I remember she came to me, greeted me, and hugged me, and, 
and bring me around the classroom and keep on asking me something, and I don't know what she was saying. So, so she gave me a piece of paper, uh, and I took the paper, I wrote down the only thing I know. I wrote two and why. You know, because I sort of see this two and why on the ticket on the, uh, at the airport. So I wrote to my wife, said, ah, very good, Tony. <laughs> there you go. That's how I got the name. Being an interior designer, we, we tend to create things. We create the intangible part. Then using the tangible to envelope it. You know, so, so it's always about the packaging and the content. This is a perfect example. Andas is an absolute perfect example. It's not flamboyant. It's never meant it to be flamboyant. However, it is a package of soul. I did, I did some work for Fred at the uh, store planning at the Bloomingdale Federated Store. Uh, Fred Palatinus. I did some work for David Easton, uh, Michael LaRocca, uh, I did some work for Ray Kendall, which is a great illustrator for Law & Taylor newspaper. Then eventually I wind up with a uh, small firm, Charles Mount. He had a small, very small office up on the Upper West Side. And in those days, he's got a little small social circle. John Saladino, Joe, Joe Derso, those guys. Uh, occasionally you get uh, Juan Montoya stop by, you know, you know that, that generation of, of guys. And they used to come in, Charles always cook, and they always chit chat, drink wine. I said, oh, gee, this is a good life. I can live with this. You know, being a young designer, sometimes you don't know what you're doing. You want to do everything. He tend to be more focused, you know. To design a great restaurant, you, learn, you must learn how to eat. If you can't eat, you can design. So, eat. <laughs> And that sort of opened up a new career for me. I, I think, I think, you know, back in the 80s, the restaurant got bigger. You know, those days, I mean, restaurants just so flamboyant. Uh, then, of course, my cafe society was equally flamboyant. Uh, the money was all come from Wall Street. And the Black Monday, um, I think 514 points later, everybody's out of a job. And you learn something. You, you learn to deal with uh, a good sense of reality. So that's the reason why I went to Asia. When I went out there, there was nobody out there. And you learn, you only can be a great designer if you get to practice design. Uh, if you don't practice design, your design not gonna get better. Really, so I think the 10 years I get to practice design, I draw, I design, I make mistakes, I, I went through the whole thing. I wanted to have this terrazzo floor with the cobalt blue and green glass chip in the terrazzo floor. And the Japanese contractor looked at me and says, what are you talking about, glass chip? And they, the Japanese said, nah, no such thing. I said, oh, watch me. Go give me a bottle of Coca-Cola. And I drink the bottle of Coca-Cola and crash, crash, crash the bottle. He said, here's a green glass. Here, put it in. So the next thing you know, the whole job site is drinking Coca-Cola. <laughs> uh, that started the relationship with the higher. This is the original park in Shanghai. Uh, Shanghai was an exception opportunity. First of all, it's Mori building. And, and they want to build this, this second tallest building uh, in China. And Bill Peterson, which I love Bill's work, and Bill worked out this wonderful geometry. So pure. And I look at this building, I say, could this building be a landmark one day? And I believe it could. Not every building can, but this one can. You know, and I just want to be part of that landmark building process. I remember the day I went to make the presentation to Mr. Mori. I said, Mr. Mori, and, and I wrote down one word in Japanese, in kanji, means silence. And they thought, and the people around the room, they thought I wanted them to be quiet. Or nobody talked. I said, no, 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 you can't talk. So I said, you know, I really want to build silence to contrast, to contrast the city. You know, because Shanghai is absolutely crazy, you know, with all that traffic. So I say, you know, can you imagine if we create this contrast, then we have the complete cycle of the 24 hours. This is not about creating this theatrical. It's not about that. It's all about creating a form that follows certain function. My interior architecture is always very rigid. It's always based on order, always based on certain geometry. 
Uh, and the reason behind that is I believe in everything that my room will be chaos, including the light coming in, including all you guys are chaos. So, so everything in the rooms are chaos, and I use that to contain the chaos. So I practice that. So in fact, the design is actually very aggressive. Like you just don't know it. Because I work very hard to make sure the design go away. I develop a set of vocabularies in design. And then I, I take these vocabulary to heart and I try to understand what it means. I try to know how to use it. Wine wall, what is it? You know, it's wine but not a wall. I'm not a wall person. I can create the wine adjacent to the sommelier and did I, or is it, did I not make his life easier? Architects tend to focus on the outside quite a bit and they, they tend to forget looking at things from the inside out. Client tend to say, oh, you're architect, then you build me a trophy then. The trophy is all about the outside, it's not about the inside. How many trophies do you know that you can actually break and say, oh, how, what a wonderful material. I, I can tell you one, one story with a recent experience when all the architects are looking at the mock-up curtain wall, full-size curtain wall, they are looking, admiring the, the beautiful detail, the beautiful fabrication, and I'm only yo-yo in the back of this curtain wall looking at it from the back because, you know, that's my room. <laughs> How did it look? Well, it didn't look very well. <laughs>
are the most global traveler I think I've ever met from way back. It's not like now people are traveling, but now people travel for projects all over, but you have been for decades, correct? <laughs> well, I got an itchy fee. What do you expect? <laughs> <laughs> well, you're not lucky me, right? Uh, I don't know how to stand still, but regardless, you, I got actually pretty lucky on this trip. You know, I took off in January and uh, I figured, you know, I'm going to, I knew about this, some kind of thing going on in China at that time of the early stage. And I said, you know, I'm going to go there, just get things off the ground. And I did. And I think that was on the 18th of January. And I bought out just in time. <laughs> then wow. I went to India. Then I went to Singapore. Then I went to Bangkok. By the time I came back to Taipei, and that was it. My luck ran out. Since then. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but you're in your apartment, right? Tell everybody. That is your apartment, yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Lucky me. Uh, yeah. Tammy, Tammy built a lovely apartment for us uh, based in Asia. It's sort of like a hub, you know, because we travel mm -hmm. so much and we stay in the hotel quite often. And often that you miss your bed. So we sort of brought our bed with us and permanently based. The, you know, the, one of the reasons why we're here in Taipei, it is the most remote, centrally located, mm -hmm. perfectly connected, you know, to New York, to Tokyo, uh, to Kyoto, where our project was, to Hong Kong, so all that's all connected within, no exaggeration, 75 minutes away. Wow. So, so we, we, we did the apartment here many years ago, mm -hmm. and we, we fly to Taipei, we overnight, you know, climatize our body and mind, then we're <laughs> off to wherever we are. So, 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 so lucky that we had this. If I didn't, can you imagine, Cindy? I would be stuck in the hotel for 32 days. I can't, I can't imagine. Well, I, actually, I actually remember when you were getting this apartment. This was like a very, very long time ago. For those of you just joining us, we're with Tony Chi and his daughter, Allison, and Tammy is your amazing wife. And she's the one who put the apartment together, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so anyhow, I'm lucky here. It is Friday night. It has been a long week. Uh, it has been a very long week uh, working still. I can't believe the world's not shutting down yet. <laughs> so, Tony, let's, you, you know, your, your clients are global clients. How are they doing and how are you communicating with them? Mm. What's happening? Obviously, the hospitality world just got hit in such a big way. Well, yeah, it's, this is probably the first time ever. Uh, that, that we have such a mega, mega setback. However, we lucky that our clients, uh, some of them actually took this opportunity to progress further. They figure if, if it's down, hotel's empty, and they might as well go. Hey, so, so actually some of the project actually accelerated uh, more than before. Wow. Uh, I, we're, we're, I mean, I, I came back from Singapore I stayed there for a week. I mean, the, the owner basically said, what, we, what if we do this? What if we do that? Let's just expand the work. Let's just get this thing done. Let's get this out of the way. I mean, that's wonderful, isn't it? That's amazing. That's amazing. And, mm. you're, and you're the type of person also who can make it happen. You probably told them that's what they needed to do. And they said, okay, okay, okay whatever you want. <laughs> no, no, actually, you know what? This is all about believing in something, right? Yes. We all still believe in our infrastructure. We're believing in our society. We're believing in our country. We're absolutely believing in our industry. Okay? So this is only going to make us better and stronger. Hospitality, the same. These guys cannot do without us in the right. design industry, okay? Mm -hmm. And we need them as well. So it's a hand in the glove. And I think in this case, I think everyone sees the same goal. You know, right. of course, they are project, uh, sort of, uh, you know, suffer quite a bit financially. Uh, but I think it's gonna turn. I think it will turn for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Allison, you being the next generation, right? Technology's got to play a huge role in being able to support these projects and even support Tony when he's off by himself drinking the wine in his apartment. <laughs> no, you're, you're, I mean, you're absolutely right. I think that, um, you know, we've always been a very international firm from day yeah. one and before, you know, as, as an infant, we were sort of always on right. the road. Um, so, but I think that in today's world, um, you know, leveraging technology in a way that works for us is the most important thing. Like there's so much happening and so quickly, you're, you're, you know, you're jumping from one platform to the next. But I think it really allowed us to figure out what our processes were and are and what, how can we leverage, you know, even low tech, but 
um, manage it so that we can actually do our work and do our work thoroughly and properly and at the pace that we feel comfortable with. And more importantly, to bring our partners, whether it's our vendors, suppliers, um, our clients on board with us. So, you know, it's been, it's been a really sort of smooth transition for us just because, you know, we tried to anticipate it to the best that we could. We did some like or internal workshops in the studio, everyone found like a different nook and then like dialed in. So we tested all the platforms. And um, so since, we, since we've since we been moving offline or online and off out of the studio, um, it's, it's actually been very productive for us. And, you know, we're treating it as if we're still together, the culture is strong. Um, and I think that remaining positive and staying positive is the most important thing for us. Yeah, I would imagine, Tony, you were ahead of the curve, um, being close to projects in China, knowing that this this was going to affect and ripple ripple down. Well, well, you know, we 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 have been uh, out here since uh, uh, I was probably thirty five years now. So we've seen the ups, we've seen the ups, we've seen the down. Uh, yeah. I think what it, what is important is, of course. Uh, you know, we don't do the volume work. We do very selectively with some of the clients, certain type of work. And the work we do is about having the sustainability, just like the work, you know, you broadcast, right? Now, how do we do something is not temporary? How do we have a client that is not temporary? How do we build a design that's not temporary? How do we build uh, the clientele that can have a heritage transferring? Right to the next generation, and that's not temporary. So, so I think if you keep that in mind, that can sustain anything, right? Even though we have had recession in the past, uh, we had 9/11, we had 2008. Uh, you know, we we had those things, but this time maybe a little bit different. But you know, at the end of the day, it is all about the 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 uh, the you know their intention, and I think most of our clients. Uh, lucky us that their intention is always a, in the goodwill. They they are in the long haul. They're not there just to flip the coin. Right. Uh, and then, then that's great for us and that's great for them. Um, I mean, the question here is come down to something that for us to realize how do we hold everyone together? I'm not in this by myself. Don't forget, we have team. Today, this is my sixth call, six, my number six video conference call. Your favorite and, one, and though. It's your favorite. It's my, your favorite. My, my favorite. You know what? Absolutely. Yes. We keep the best at last. Cindy, <laughs> exactly. you are the icing on the cake. Right. Right. You know, <laughs> you will put me, you will absolutely put me to a wonderful sleep tonight. But, <laughs> but today, today, I think, you know, very seldom I'm trying to hold the team together. You know, today in the conference call, everybody locked down. The, the latest news today by the prime minister in Singapore is that I locked down the city. So that means all jobs need to stop today officially. So, mm. so meanwhile, we have over four or five hundred staff, I mean, people on the site building it. And, and now yeah. they all now they all have to go home. So so today was discussing about what do we do tomorrow? I mean, they're gonna wake up tomorrow, they're not coming to work, right? So 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 one of the meetings today I went through today at four o'clock, and I said, you know, how do I keep this promise ongoing and then the client absolutely will keep it going but this is not up to the client this is up to the country lockdown right, uh, right. but you know but you know me I'm, I'm so highly spirited i'm jumping doing the song the dance and at least give them a a, 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 a upside right as i say guys it's just temporary but we still have the video conferencing we still can talk about issues i mean today we had cindy we had venice on the call we had Milan on the call. Now we have Mike Gracie just before that. We're all on the call. So that means all the partners from all over the world are all part of this. Right. Right? So, so I think that is a very hopeful thing, you know? And I was telling everyone, I said, you know, I'm talking to Cindy tonight. <laughs> yeah. <You know? laughs> right? Keep so, them positive. So, so, you have to keep them positive. I mean, exactly. absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You, you know, and I, I think that, the, of course, they announced it today at 4 4 20 that prime minister locked down the country, everything must stop. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I can see everyone's face in the conference room, you know? Oh my God. Like, oh yeah. my God. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah. yeah. So we, we, we have to keep this thing uh, highly spirited. I think everything we do uh, and everything they are doing, everything you are doing, we, we're not here just, just somehow putting the bandaid over any wound. We're here basically 
just have a collective reflection, right? Look at what we did and look at, look at what we're going to do. And I think, you know, whether it's 2020 to wash out, it doesn't really matter, right? As far as we are concerned, the project, based on my project in Singapore at this point, we're not moving the goalposts back. We are opening in September, mm. right? I imagine this, Cindy. No one even knows September will be any customer come to visit Singapore or not. But we're still on that September schedule. Is this I mean, that's pretty this out there. With, is this with Rosewood? Oh, uh, this one, no, actually this one is not. This is with, one with the uh, Pontiac. They own the Ritz-Carlton Singapore. So mm. this is the Ritz-Carlton Singapore renovation project. Mm -hmm. uh, which we redoing the lobby, we're redoing the restaurant, we're doing the, uh, the, the meeting facilities, uh, we're doing a new bar for them. So it's, a, it's a, and we're doing a new garden, right? So, so it's a pretty mega opening for September. And don't forget September also is the Formula One for right. Singapore, right? So, so all this thing, uh, so far, we're not erasing that out of our ball game. And we still anticipate September, uh, we will resume. Maybe we'll resume stronger. Uh, we will resume with as a better people, I suppose, right? So, so in this case, people that are actually working on the job, not just me alone, but everyone else, right? right? How do we keep their hope going, right? We, we don't want them to feel like, oh, you know, the job's going to stop. Right? Mm -hmm. we, we, we actually don't want them to feel that way. No, 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 no. No. You have to lead that. Lead the the way you're moving um, in a right. positive direction. And you are a leader. Like people mm -hmm. listen to you. You know, you have that. You have that. Uh, I, I like that. It, it, no, you have a <laughs> conviction. That's it. Your conviction is like that. No, it. you know why? Because we, we do one job at a time, right? If I don't do this, then I have no jobs. You know, <laughs> I, 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 when I remember on January 18th, I went to Shanghai which we're building a 4,000 square meter, which is 40,000 square feet home. And, and I said, you know, this is right after, right before the Chinese New Year, let me just get the, the, the project off the ground. Mm -hmm. I never thought about this, this yeah. epidemic issue. It was none of those issues. I just want to get the project off the ground before the Chinese New Year. Mm -hmm. I mean, and lucky I did that. And I tell wow. you, you know, Cindy, I even organized this, say, guys, after Chinese New Year, I want to have a meeting in, uh, in Lake Iseo, that's outside of Milan, by 50 minutes, yeah. to go, go visit our window fabricator in Italy. So I want the entire project team to be in Italy with me. Then I want to take them to Verona for a week mm -hmm. to see my favorite Carlo Scappa. I yeah, mean, oh, that was planned. Yeah, you know? it was planned. Yeah, amazing. it was planned. Yeah, wow. but now... So yeah. up and smoke. <laughs> yeah. Now I want to talk about Rosewood because they're also a multi-generational company. And um, Allison, you're coming in as you're coming in as the daughter, right? And and I understand there's great advantage, I feel like. There's great advantage to your office. You have people who've been there their entire career, Tony. And then you have a next generation coming up. So what is what is the what is that like? And and tell us what, why that is an advantage. <laughs> well, I, well, I think that the most important thing um, for us was really recognizing our strengths. I think, you know, with my dad being such a strong leader and having such a strong voice, I think our sense of identity has always been very strong and it's centered around him and around his philosophy. Yeah. But I think our efforts now, um, which I'm, I'm sort of taking the lead on, is to really be able to distill from that and to be able to understand how we can really formulate a multidisciplinary um, one team firm that, you know, has associates that's been with him for their entire careers, as you right. just mentioned, but also to onboard young talent that um, I can hopefully bridge to communication. You know, communication is such an important thing um, that's so uh, challenging nowadays. Things are moving so quickly. People are so easily misunderstood um, that, you know, I think leveraging technology, leveraging um, you know, those that are in sort of in between generations, to be able to have conversations with both sides in a very frank, honest way. And I think that sort of compassion and that sort of transparency is important to better understand each other. And, and you know, our goal as a firm is to really be able to be a strong brand that represents sort of some sense of integrity within the industry. And, you know, we really want to be able to bring um, and nurture young designers that can join us and to really find that sort of integrity in their own work 
um, and find the studio as a place that has that that practices that level of um, quality, but also practices being good, you know, to develop yourself as a human and to be a well-rounded um, designer, a well-rounded person. You know, I think I reflect from the experience that we have right now, you know, I, th I think it, the fact that we're all grounded in our homes is really f interesting for what, how that would impact our industry as interior design. You know, I think our homes and houses have really become these machines that, you know, we do operate in, you know, everyone is now figuring out that their, their houses are not working for them. So there's going to be the sense of like real life experiences that will give them by them. I mean, everybody a stronger vocabulary to, to talk about interior design. I think that will be really helpful for us um, as we're in hospitality, residential design, to be able to have this conversation of how do you live in your own home? How does it serve you? How do you serve it? And how do you design for that? Um, so that's something that I think we're really interested in um, as a studio. It's, right so, it's so true. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm a, we're in our weekend house and now we literally are taking a, one bedroom and turning it into an office. <laughs> And I'm like, oh my God, I need an office chair. <laughs> um, I mean, Tony, I want to what? No, the hardest thing is actually to prevent myself from getting up and start moving things around. Cause I'll be like, at my computer, I'm like, I really need to reorganize my, my drawer right now. Like, you it's know, I have to prevent problem. myself from doing that. Um, but I, I, you know, that's, that's good experience. You know, that's what, that's what it is. You know, that hands-on experience is what we do. Um, yeah. So I think that's pretty exciting. Yeah, and so so I see like I see here that um, I just wanted to bring up Rosewood because they're also multi generational. So are mm. are you guys dealing with the younger folks moving mm. up into that business? Yeah, I you mean, know, let, let, let me let me highlight this one, Allison. I, I, yeah. I, let me say this, okay? You know, I I need to learn how to tone down my my volume, okay? I need to <laughs> learn how to tone down my existence in many ways. Uh, you know, all my clients. Uh, our world generation family, okay? And I do their home, uh, and I did their home, I maintain their home, uh, and I work with their grandfather, I work for their father, I work for their grandchildren now. So I'm, I'm encountering all three generations so far. I mean, Rosewood, for example, we're working with Sonia. Sonia's the third generation. Her grandfather and I worked together 32 years ago. That's Henry, her father, yeah, her father and I worked together for, uh, for, for, I don't know, for donkey years. And her mother, uh, when she was building the family compound in Hong Kong with nine houses, and, and of course, Tammy and myself and, and Bill, we worked on that house for nine years, wow. two houses for nine years, right? Now, of course, Sonia, was, well, she was a kid. They used to call me Uncle Tony, but now she's the chairman of the board, you know? So. <laughs> So somehow change, change, Tony. I, hey, you know what, Cindy? I tell you, I, I have to learn this, right? I used to walk into the meeting room, feel, yeah, I own it. Yeah, it's my call, it's my voice, it's my design, it is my job. And I I can't do that. You know, I, I gotta find room for them. So so that took a while to learn. I mean, I actually learned from Sonia's father, right? I mean, I mean, they own the Rosewood, right? I mean, the story actually quite funny. You know, Sonia came back from Harvard and she said, I, I don't want to run the family business, but I like to run a hotel company. So her father basically said, fine, you do your hotel things, right? I was there and I, I was there from day one. So the dad says, Tony, you will help my daughter to build her brand. So I remember myself, Robert Louis, were designing a brand and she wanted to be, I mean, very first originated brand from Asia, right? And she called it the Mulberry, you know? And she, she actually spent a lot of effort developing it with us until right. her father figured all out that, you know, sweetheart, it's easier to buy a brand. So, yeah. she, so, he, bought, so he bought the Rosewood for her. A nice birthday, life, right? nice life. A nice life, right? Yeah. So, so that's how I started, you know? But I remember when I first started, she complained the first job was London. And I was, Bullying, I was like, this like my you. job. Didn't like you. No, no, it was my job, right? So I was formulating uh, the Rosewood. I was building it. I was designing it. And she, her mother came. I remember that day very well. Her mother came and she complained it. She said, Mom, Tony won't listen to me. Then uh, her mother says, well, she won't listen to me either. <laughs> so 
shocking. Remember, it's all very walk. shocking. No, no, seriously, Cindy, yeah. I tell you, I, I walk up and I absolutely think that, yes, I never realized time flies. Yeah. Uh, you got to give them some space. So I, 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 since then, that was what, I don't know, since London opening, I tried to tone it down. I tried to back off a little bit. Allison did a, a, a wrap up the Hong Kong, which is the grand finale, right? For the Rosewood. Uh, it took her, I don't know how long it took you, Allison? Almost two years, right? Going to Hong Kong every month. Do you, do you think he's, because I love how he said, um, I got to tone it down, but Allison, let me say this first, okay? <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, it's, it's, we're working on it. <laughs> um, process, it's a process. To, yeah, to, to his point, you know, it, it's not an easy thing, um, whether it's the, the Sonia's family and the Rosewood family, or it's even the Singapore family, you know, that they're also three generations. Um, right. I've had conversations with uh, both younger generations and which, you know, words like we're transitioning, we're transforming, you know, we have this conversation, but it's not something you can rush. Um, and I think, and you know, my opinion about it has always just been, you know, every generation, every every side of every conversation wants to be heard. You know, but I think it starts with, you know, equal compassion, equal respect for each other's point of views. Um, I think in the, in the world that was, you know, in the past, it was very much sort of, you know, as you gain in your life, as you get older, as you, you know, it was very sort of one direction. But I think today in the world that we live in, especially the fact that we're all connected digitally, you know, you have 18 year olds that are, that impress the socks off of me, you know, and you have 65 year olds that are still learning and, you know, it doesn't really quite matter, but I think it's about, um, you know, making an extra effort to understand each other and to be able to say what you mean um, and, and really stand behind it. Um, so yeah, I think that the, whether it's the Singapore family or the, the Hong Kong family, you know, that what they've done is impressive, you know, like how they've been able to uh, pivot and to apply their strongest assets to create something for the new world and hopefully a better world is incredibly impressive. And I, I highly respect what they've done. Um, I think Sonia is really, really innovative in what she's done with Rosewood Brand. We're really fortunate to be able to be part of that journey with them. Um, and and I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing, you know, what will come um, in our world because everything is sort of mashing up, whether it's media, whether it's um, um, design, you know, everything is sort of one narrative now. So, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm really excited for that. So, um. uh, Tony, your, your daughter is pretty impressive, huh? What, what, do you, what do you think about her? <laughs> well, listen, I'm not talking. <laughs> I, I'm all zipped. There you go. There you go. You know, it's, it's it's good. You know, it's 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 um. You know, my mother has always been sort of this rock for us. Um, I think my dad and I are Best. very, She's very similar, <laughs> very similar personalities. So, you know, my mother is sort of like, you know, sideline uh, refereeing on both sides. So, you know, yeah, yeah. We're really fortunate to have her. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, even, you know, even what you're doing um, with these interviews online, I think it's an amazing commitment. And, you know, thank you for doing that. Mm -hmm. I, I've, I've watched a few of them um, these past few days and leading up to this conversation. And, and it's great information. Uh, it's, I think it's great for our industry. Um, it's exciting for those that are, you know, friends of mine that don't know about our industry. It's a, it's a platform that they're familiar with. Right. Um, and so it's easy to understand. So I, I think that's really cool. You know, Tony, you know, when we started to do this, mm. I was thinking about hospitality, it was like, well, we got to reach out to Tony, like, you know, bar none, you're somebody that, you know, has, has the voice. And I'm really happy to see the family bit, you know, because I think of like when I was in your office, how mm. even everyone eats together, like, like that kind of family connection is so beautiful. <clears throat> you see it in the work, you see it in the companies that you work for. And it's really, it's really, it's really a special, special place to be. And we, we honor you because of that, Tony. No, thank you so much, Cindy. Listen, you know, you know, uh, we are the biggest uh, pain in the butt in our voices as well. Uh, but at least fundamentally, we, we are a true believer and the believer yes. in the hospitality, right? With right. your effort, we built an amazing cathedral one day. But without you, we can only build a little little chapel, right? So the reality of it, it all comes down to uh, the hospitality. And Cindy, the, the fact is with this pandemic issue, 
that really allowed us to think about what Alice just said before. Now we all have to somehow reflect how we work at home, right? Mm. A lot of us never take our home or taking our home for granted. Right. But now you're looking at our home as something we always talked about, right? You always start your hospitality from home, right. you know? Now, in the future, do you really need to somehow go to work in the office anymore? You can more or less work anywhere, more or less, right? So we're still able to be connected, not physically, but, but mentally, you know, through the technology, let's say you can be in the country, I can be in another part of the world. We are actually connected from heart to heart. I think this will change our world completely. Yeah. Yeah. It's sort of like, when do you, when is remote the answer and when is the connection? Um, yeah. the physical connection, the answer. And they probably have more meaning when we get it right, right? I'm closing right. an issue today. It will be the first issue I've ever closed wow. in 20 years remotely. I don't like it. That, that's hard. <laughs> the end, you know, the end piece is hard because I won't physically see the last pages. Yeah. Like, yeah. but we're doing it and the team's amazing. Uh, and to your point um, on, you know, I think I think the family values bit um, is one of the reasons why I think we're, we've been able to transition into this remote style of working, um, you know, fairly smoothly. Uh, I think it's, you know, with family values for us, it's really about that's the way we communicate. Well, listen, thanks. Thanks so much. I'm so happy that we that Thank both you. of you um, yeah. from all over the world, we're all together, right? And yeah. we, we look up to you and um, thank you. respect you so much. And we know that you'll help, you. help us get through. Thank, thank you. you. No, no, you're, you're, you're leading us all. Thank you. Thank no. you. Okay. Lots of love, you guys. Thank you. Bye. Thank love you. Blessed, Allison. Bye. Yeah. Love everyone. Bye. not such a good designer or a good illustrator, but I always knew exactly what would happen in fashion. And we would go to Paris, to Saint Laurent, and I would already have the, the coat which was on the runway. So that has always been the case. And this is where they discovered that I had that nose. And so they started to develop a, a curriculum especially for me to trained me in that sense. Our trends are not about gadgets or fancy moments. They are really about very long rolling sort of movements of society. has so much positive value, so incredible deep relations to our psyche, to the, to the planet, to everything in our systems. Lee is an educator. She characterizes herself, I think the term is trend forecaster. It's a hell of a lot of work, a lot of study, ear to the ground, talking to people, analysis. I mean, she's a student of human behavior which allows her to say, this is where I think we want to go. And then she actually takes responsibility for taking us there. I was born in Wageningen, which is a small medieval town in the Netherlands. Because I was born in 50 and there was nothing. So I used cardboard and I just created all sorts of objects and a music player and records and I would hear music and everything was in my brain. So even today, I think this is the background of the way I work. In Trends Union, we publish 
portfolios with ideas. There is a color card. Then there is a general trend book, which is the big sort of textile book, which is the Bible of the season, which has all the secrets and all the details and so on. Then there is a book on menswear, and then we do once a year um, a book of, on interior and design. The color card in the end will be presented like this. Mm. It has, you know, all the dyed colors in wow. color ranges. Oh, that's so beautiful. Now I'm studying the new ones, which are for mm. autumn, winter 2020. Oh, wow. I called it Indian summer, like India. So this is the strange colors between sort of old rose yeah. and brick. These are very strange colors. Hare Krishna. He is amazing. So you could just imagine how you can make knitwear and, you know. The world of adult courts, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Early on, where were you gravitating towards? Was it primarily fashion then? It was really fashion. I was really educated in fashion and this was my thing. And design became a second very big obsession when the Design Academy asked me to be head of a department of design. At Eindhoven? Yeah. yeah. So then I spent for 10 years, one week a month in Eindhoven. It was an explosion of creativity. She asked questions. She challenged. Lee liked the mess. The values that were emerging, the humanity, let's say, that was brought back to craftsmanship, to the, to the human hand. She argued that we're talking about seeing a designer's mind converting something, taking it to the next level based on where we are in the world today. But you actually do work with big companies. Yeah, they ask very brave for them to ask me, very brave for me to go in front of the lions. The car I made with Nissan I don't even have a license. And they said, that doesn't matter. We know how to design a car, but we want to know what is the context and how are people going to live and what is the situation. It looked weird in those days, but got all the prices a car can get in 1993. And then all the other cars were designed in that manner. Even also when I work on curriculums and you know, on designing schools, it's always with in mind what will happen. As you said, it's only a year old that there's this, this yes. maker studio. There is a real interest from students more and more into making. Mm. And it's funny because 10 years ago, all schools wanted to get rid of all making material. And now there is this backlash from the students on, from the art, from the architecture, from the design, yeah. from fashion. To say, I want to make stuff, I want to have tactility, and I want to make tech stuff. Yes, <laughs> that is fantastic. The youngest generation are completely in favor of a better world. Working together, working in teams, no longer ownership, it's a new breed. We are going to a new future, but maybe it's a new system. Textiles are going to make an enormous comeback. And in the end, maybe, we will see that the 21st century is the century of textiles. Are you optimistic about the future? It's very hard to say, because I'm going to write a trend forecast for 2050. But the next step is more difficult because we have such conflicting mentalities, politics, economics, and so on, that it's almost that you have to predict who is going to win, win. the time. Who's going to win? <laughs> Lee, help us. I think us. Yeah. <laughs> I think us, but it will be a narrow escape. It will be a narrow escape. But in the end, I think with this young generation, we are going to choose 
humanity. Hey everybody, this is Cindy Allen, Editor-in-Chief of Interior Design Magazine, and you've just watched our film on design giant, Lee Edelcourt. We did it a few years back, but we are so fortunate to catch up with Lee today, who is far, far away. And we're gonna talk about her view on the crisis and rebuilding a better society. Lee, I'm so happy to see you. Good to see you. So beautiful seeing you. I hear you're in South Africa, right? Yes, we stranded here the day after Valentine's Day. Oh. And after a week, uh, I looked at Philip, you know, my partner in New York, right. in the world. And uh, I said, Philip, we're not going to America because that's going to be too dangerous. Yes. And there was no reason really to think that then, but the instinct was right. Ah. And I just knew that I would teach my students online and that, you know, and I had read that there's not even a million hospital beds in America. And I said, oh my God, that, that's very oh. dangerous. Oh my goodness. So you're it's in Cape Town right, right now, right? Yeah, so we stayed in South Africa, went to Cape Town, encountered this amazing eccentric lady who has this new hotel called Dorp. It's like village. Uh -huh. And it's actually a little village with little cottages on the, on the mountain of Boca in the Muslim area with all the colored houses. And uh, it's, in a, yeah, we have been confined in heaven. <laughs> oh my goodness. Not, not, so, not so bad, but I know, I know the instinct is, you know, to also be near your students. So just so everybody knows, you're the Dean of Hybrid Studies at Parsons. It's been a five year gig, right? Five years, yeah. is it ending now? Yeah, it's ending. Oh my goodness. So yeah. you, That's you were very traumatic, you know, to end without being there. Yeah. Oh, my, oh my goodness. And this was such, um, you know, s such a revolution, like in a way, because you started a master's program and really dug in deep with these students, right? Yes, it was an amazing journey. And I must tell you all that the first ever graduation we had a few weeks ago is amazing all the students are are great and several are, of them are star star designers so we are so lucky that you know it works that we have this super faculty you know bringing the students to these results that my director um, pretty gobinat is so super human that she knows how to get this future stars into the world. And uh, yeah, I'm very, very proud, very proud. That's, that's amazing. I hear that uh, you, the, that they were doing all this really interesting work being very restricted in their apartments and you started sharing it on your Instagram or something like that, right? Yeah. You know, I was so impressed. There was one guy, he undid a loan, brought it to the seller of his building, you know, near the heating system. Yeah. We made a loan because he wanted to make a very, very big uh, lengths of fabric and another student um, decided to take her table, her dinner table, and reformed it into a loom and wow. made uh, incredible textiles with scraps of saris. So, and other ones, you know, adapted the, the size of their work and suddenly they needed to uh, not project an exhibition but make a film of their work. So, they had to make documentaries in a way to that's, show it the work. That's amazing. I saw why what went on and I saw a beautiful that a beautiful one that looked like an installation with rolled felt and the and yes. the designer was under it. That looks that's so you. You have been such an amazing influence on these students. That's uh, Sagarita. Yes, yeah, she's a, it was a real shamanistic experience what she did. Yeah. She's a felt maverick and uh, she will all of them will do very well because we educated them uh, to be independent, to be um, craft-minded, to go your own way, to uh, carve your own future. So we are not worried for their future because they have been, I would say, really prepared for this moment. How would you describe the students in, you know, in New York versus um, overseas where you've always been you know teaching 
Well, our students are actually from all over the world. Right, that's true. So although that's true. although they are in New York and New Yorkers, they we had American students from different states. So you know, I I have learned in the recent period that the states of America are countries and should be countries, yeah. and yeah. that we should have the uh, states united instead of the United States. Yeah. Uh, so even to be American, I think, means um, several things. So the students compare very much to any other student body I've seen in the world. As long as if you give students the right openings and the right motivation and the right um, structure and the right curriculum, you know, this blooming starts to happen no matter where you are. Right, right. So but I really could imagine they were really, really engaged by somebody like you and absorbed like sponges. Well, that's a compliment. I haven't they been there as much, of course. Yeah. But uh, yes, I I really adored being with them. And I, I regret stopping. But at the, at the same time, you know, I need to move on to other things. So it was a, a beautiful capsule of time. Yes, no, and we're, we were also lucky. In fact, that's where at least we were able to spend some time together because we were in New York. Um, Quality and, time. And it meant so much, and it meant so much to me and to the industry for sure. So Lee, let's talk about the virus. And you say it's like a blank page for a new beginning. Um, yes. Well, we all knew that we were working too hard and had too much stress. We all knew that we were spending too much and buying too much. We all knew that we were producing far too much, uh, especially in fashion, but also in interior. We all knew that um, Instagram forced companies to make special items for any country and for any event and all this waste and all this transport and so on. But we didn't know how to, to jump off, right. you know? Right. So we discussed it over and over again for right. years. Right. And so some brave people did, you know, step off. But most of us were just trying to control, trying to rein in, trying to motivate people to do better and less. Yet, you know, the machine was just rolling, right. uncontrolled. And so came this virus and suddenly stopped. And we go, we retreat into our own environment. And so there was a quarantine of consumption where suddenly you, the only thing you could buy is food and even not all food. And so food buying became the, the leisure of the day, right. you know. And sure. you yeah. went in your cupboard and you rediscovered your clothes, which you never really knew. And they were a friends because for once you had you know, this relationship building up between them and you, you had time. You also discovered your kitchen because you started to cook again. You know, now everybody wants to enlarge their kitchens because it has been the, the place to be. Right. Then you discovered that sleeping in a bit was making you look so much better, you know, on Zoom. And <laughs> the first of the time, many parents told me they discovered their kids. Mm. They say, I'm so grateful for this period because I would not have known my kid ever. Right. This wouldn't have happened. Right. Suddenly also parents understood how incredibly important are teachers. Mm. So and true. So true. I mean, oh my God, everyone's pulling out their hair trying to teach their kids. Yeah. yeah. And so it did so many things to us and we started to dance and sing together and um, much longer emails, personal emails, I call them e-letters. Uh -huh. uh, much more Skypes with family and friends. Mm -hmm. It was an amazing period, even if so difficult. Yes, yes. So it learned us very basic human values again. You know, so in our, in the design world, I used to always say, um, because, you know, there was this big movement for health and wellness. And I used to say, this is the best movement, but we're all working harder than ever <laughs> to try to make it happen. So as yeah. you said, there needed to be a stop and like a deeper, deeper understanding of what we kind of already knew, but like you said, couldn't stop. And how beneficial it becomes because people 
become creative. Right. We have, you know, where we have seen reports about that, that you need to be lazy, that you need to walk in nature for an hour a day, that you need to embrace um, trees, you know, hug trees uh, to sort of ground you. So we know all these things, but then we didn't do those things. Right. And I think now um, we come to a turning point where luxury and design and interior values will, will change and it will change for the better. I hope that the trauma and the disaster is big enough for it to happen this time. Right. It was, we had the same reaction after 9-11. Mm -hmm. We had a similar, not as violent reaction after the economic crisis. But this is number three in one century. So right. I think this is like a more powerful force. And then today it's coupled with the political agony in many yeah. countries, including yours, of course. Yeah, absolutely. And then what happens in the streets today. So it's, we have this accumulated forces uh, towards change. Mm -hmm. And it's yeah. going rapid now and it's, it's taking over. And so, yes, I'm very, optimistic about that yeah i was going to say you're you are ho you are hopeful i mean yeah. it's it's hard to understand as you say how it will shake out and or our bad habits <laughs> coming yeah. back in um but yeah three you know right one two three um i'm glad um, i'm glad to that you're you're doing something about it too because you're starting you're starting a a, a forum a world forum right yes talking about hope Yes. Uh, during our time here, um, which has been very productive because we've been working very hard. Right. We've been in contact with many companies, you know, trying to figure out how they could prepare their, their future. We did webinars and so. And at one point we discussed with Philip and we said that we really needed to take this momentum and bring it further. So uh, I invented the World Hope Forum, which is um, a counter movement to the World Economic Forum, which is for the 1%, for the bankers and the rich and very famous. Uh, yeah, the, what, no, the World Forum is the other people, right? <laughs> and um, we are going to, to make this forum for us, creative people. Because I think that creative people are underrated in the shaping of, of society and culture and politics and economics. Right. And that basically, um, we, now that everything needs to be reset, we need uh, our forces to look at a new circular future. So um, what we're going to do is that it's a world organization with uh, ambassadors in each country, which then has this chapter going to do uh, local events and congresses to harvest all good ideas, to get you know, new plans, new blueprints, open source uh, design, and yeah. this all will be shared by all the members of that forum. Mm. And the fun yeah. story is that Philip um, invented that our um, members will pay 1% of what is paying the 1% for the World Economic Forum. Wow. So ours is 190, so you can figure out. Right, right. How much <laughs> <they pay. laughs> you know, that's the thing, that's, that's the issue we've always had, which is how do you value design, right? And it's always been in some way marginalized or pushed aside. And more than ever right now, where business is, you know, ruling everything we do. So um, I completely business agree with you. Marketing. What? Business and marketing. Even and marketing. in cultural institutions, now we see marketing taking decisions, taking the lead, um, you know, farming out things to do. And it's not up to that um, discipline to do that it's 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 for the curators and the makers right. and the shapers yeah and uh, i think we are constantly underrated we've been underrated since the beginning of yes. this whole field and um 
by now everybody is also educated to be an entrepreneur and to take your own life into your hand and to right. make your own budgets and so on. Right. And many young um, industrial designers actually are partnering with industry because industry doesn't have enough money anymore to do it on their own for them. So there is already this uh, growing consensus that we can work together. It needs to be more known, and I think we need desperately uh, very new ideas about almost every step of the processes. Right, right. But wouldn't that be the most amazing outcome? Yes. <laughs> it certainly, I am in. I am so in, Lee. <laughs> I'll do whatever you want. <laughs> Become our media partner, please. Yeah, sounds, and, sounds good. Sounds good to me. We're going to yeah. talk about that. Yeah, um, very good. You've also, you've also um, in July, I think, is it July that you, you're starting a webinar and fundraiser called The Future is Handmade. Tell us about that. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, for the Santa Fe uh, market, you know, the, the folk market, which is not able to take place this year. So all the artisans uh, are, you know, left alone you know, and uh, will not have the income of that uh, very profitable market for all of them. And it's not only income, it's also excitement, meeting, uh, learning. Um, yeah, it's this whole magic ev event, which is that market. And so we want to help them. And um, I made a book about folklore in fashion a few years ago because I wanted to discuss the ideas about cultural approbation, because although I agree that horrible, cheap copies are made, I also believe that there is a universal uh, value of motifs and making, which are not belonging to any, any region in the world. So actually I'm trying to see the the, the red threads through all the different uh, shapes, finishes, mm. and so on. It's, it's incredibly beautiful. It's one of the most beautiful books, of course, because yeah. you know the, the, the pictures are to die for. And um, the message is very powerful. And today in this world with, with people so much close the same, I think it's also so interesting when you see somebody with an there's a real, you know, traditional garment. It's sort of, you know, you see something okay. original and traditional at the same time. Very beautiful. Ah. Lee, is there, is there a message? Look, this is going to go out to a lot of people. Is there like a final like message you'd like to share with everybody? I mean, you really have always had such a deep understanding of what was going on in the world and and sharing it even more powerfully right now. Right now is the time, right? Yes. Well, I'm grateful for the virus, how strange that may uh, sound, because it needed to happen. If not, any other horrible thing would have happened. I'm also worried about the, 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 the virus, and I'm trying not to catch it. So I'm very, very careful. So I would urge people to be much more careful than they are because it might take two more years if we look at the, the virus 100 years ago, you know? And our governments are not, are not prepared. So we, we are left to our own wisdom. So be wise, I would say, be hopeful. Mm -hmm. And I remember very well the 9-11 situation and then I was working in a design academy. And this was the moment you could not really speak about design because it sounded so strange, you know, right. to consider such a fickle thing. And from this whole moment was born the autonomous design discipline, which now uh, has museums and galleries, you know, and, and collectors. So from disaster, I've seen it with my own eyes, from disaster, was born an absolute new field, a renaissance of form. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm hopeful because I know that human nature is able to somehow, the, the more adversary you have, you know, it's in your own life. You know, right. When you have a few setbacks, you know, there comes a day that you just start fighting back and right. great ideas come to your brain. So 
I just believe that we will have maybe finally um, the culture we deserve in the 21st century. Right, right. That's so beautiful. Yes, we'll get beyond this because of this. And yes. oh, and oh, to the power of design, right? Yeah, absolutely. And There's the human the, spirit, and the human spirit. The, the creative spirit is, is able to do everything. Right. The only thing I hope is to embrace you again. I saw in our movie, you know. I know. I know. I it was know. so shocking to see you know, know. That, that really. I know. Hurt. I'm embracing. I know. Me too. I'm embracing. You must miss that so much more than anybody else. I do miss it. Hurt. I do miss it. And it's funny that people have mentioned that to me that they missed the hug. Well, I'm sending you all my love. Philip, come in and say goodbye. Um, big hug. Big love. Is Philip. Bye. Thank you, Philip, for everything. Take care of each other. Let's send love out to the world. And Thank bless you. you. Bless you, Lee, for everything you do for all of us. All right. Okay. Bye. Bye. I'm obsessed with patterns and I'm obsessed with pattern making and I'm obsessed with these patterns actually creating space. It's not just, you know, you see the building, you walk through the building, but now you're actually invited to touch and to really engage in the material, not just the space. Mm -hmm. But for me, it's like one big beautiful sculpture. Yeah, functional art. It's, yeah. That's, that's what we're really trying to create. To me, architecture is still about experimentation. I'm never satisfied. We challenge the norm with these experiments of, of veiled transparencies or articulating surfacing. So here you really get to start to see how they're shaping the building. We're constantly sculpting the building. This is all water jets, CNC water jets, carving the stone based on our 3D model, That's which is uh, it's a new world. We're able to do amazing things now. My, my memories are of building things. I was born in Israel, but moved here when I was three. Yes, yeah, so then what was your personality like? <laughs> Rambunctious would be, uh, my mom would say, an understatement. <laughs> I do remember my mom, the way she could calm me down, was giving me stuff to build. You know, I was here from another country at a very early age, so this was my community. So I would create a little village of my own. I knew it was architecture pretty early on. I didn't know anything else, really. That's, that's what I enjoyed. But it was really the space, not a style, a language, but it was transitions or thresholds or how you know, the sun would reflect on something else. And I liked, I liked residual experiences. It was really about how materials interact or spaces interact. And to me, they were mazes, they were, they were puzzles, and they were experiences you know, to really rival eating a great meal or you know, experiencing a sports event. To me, that was my entertainment and that was my uh, earliest experience of, of real love. These are a series of interlocking uh, geometric volumes. But really what happens, if you look at it, all the geometries, all the volumes really speak to each other. This house, since publication at, in Interior Design, uh, we've received more calls than any other project we've ever done. They want this house. They, they want this house. It became the, the gold standard in our office. So we were able to refine this approach. But we didn't want to do that anymore. I didn't want to do that anymore. The need was really to evolve. The need was to experiment. 
so we took what I would consider huge risks and leap from the platform that we were comfortable on. I studied architecture formally at Harvard University Graduate School of Design. That's where mentorship became very important to me. I was there at an unbelievable time. We had Rafael Mineo, Rem Koolhaas, Preston Scott Cohen, all of these guys in one room, you know, fighting each other over designs. It was miraculous. I was able to work at the Carpenter Center on, on campus, and I got involved in printmaking. That allowed me to take a pause from architecture. Uh, I really liked creating on a very visceral level, not just what was prescribed to us in terms of program and scale. Here, let's watch your head here. Oh, yeah. There you go. You know, I like to joke and say I got my PhD in construction. I love the warmth of it. I love the material. I, love, I love the- I love the smell right now, too. I love yeah. the smell, yeah. Construction is the testing ground. So you've created a really interesting, very hoggy culture in the office, right? <laughs> My team has been with me for, for over 10 years. So it's now, you know, half clubhouse, half studio, half laboratory. Oh! <laughs> this firm has always sort of ridden the ridge between being academic on one side and being professional on the other side. Susan designed an amazing part of the Occidental McKinnon Center for Global Affairs. This space was kind of a big challenge very traditional, we, that's not what we do, so it's kind of like how do we make it be something that is what Ellsberg is about. The software that Brock is showing right now, it's basically using video game technology. That's amazing. Technology for me, uh, it's a vehicle to produce these very complex patterns. Mm. You see the subtle shifts? Mm -hmm. The architect has now become, again, the master builder, where he is in charge of not only the design, but also the pieces of the design. We get to design it in the office in three dimension, send it to a robot who brings it right back to the building, and it gets applied. Kangaroom is a very important project for the city of Los Angeles because historically it was one of the largest rumba uh, salsa dancing venues, you know, for decades. The rumba dance step is a triangle. So we started with the triangle, we started with the dance. And from the triangle, we started patterning more triangles together until we got a pedal. And we kept multiplying the pedals. So now what we call it is performance patterning because the pattern performs for us. It becomes three-dimensional. And we now have complete control of what we are doing with this space through design. You're always striving to create beauty. Like, what is it for you? The problem comes first. You can't take the same solutions from other projects and pretend that they will solve the new challenges. That's why we are constantly looking to create new opportunities through materials, technology, color, space, to solve all these new set of problems. This is a museum that's supposed to use the Holocaust as a case study for contemporary issues. So their first introduction is a park and, uh, and a rooftop landscape. As we go into the museum, the sights and sounds slowly disappear and we start to unearth stories. Something that impresses me really every day I walk in is the, where the story starts, starting with the world that was, with the dignity of the Jewish people and these individuals. You took your family's story and infused your skill into it and then make a story that really is universal. So Hagi, can you tell us about your family? My father escaped with his mom to what was then Palestine, but his entire family was, was murdered. So it was part of our duty in life to make sure that we would do what we could not to have this happen to anyone else bullying to what's happening uh, anywhere else in the world. One of the most popular exhibits that we were able to design into the space 
is this model made by hand by one of the survivors. The scale really does allow us to superimpose our own existence right into that scale. Yes, and that's what you do, yeah. right? That's what you do. This is the architect who designed the museum. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Isn't it? A... So I think that the very act of building the building was a healing gesture, and this building will stand in its solidity and its beauty for permanent remembrance. Beautiful. Thanks. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank, you, so Thank much. you. These walls, these spaces, have to perform in many different ways. And how we approach these three-dimensional spaces really allows us to create dramatic experiences at different levels. Each project becomes something that we haven't seen before. Do you feel like, oh, I am getting there, like I am satisfying this thing? I, I can't satisfy it. it. I can't satisfy this, this urge inside of me to try something new each time and to get the office, the team, our team, to always try something new. Okay, everybody, tune in tomorrow at 1 o'clock Eastern Time for day three of the Hall of Fame Film Festival. More films more design. See you then.